This time, hello, Sergeant. <clears throat> Please start your recording. The backup is rolling. Cloud is good. Thank you. Uh, Sergeant Biando, will you begin with your opening statement, sir? Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the committees on hospitals, jointly with the Committee on Health. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos for verification. Thank you. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today held by the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Health on New York City's COVID-19 testing and contact tracing program. My name is Carlina Rivera. I am the chair of the Committee on Hospitals. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague, Council Member Mark Levine for chairing this hearing with me today. I'd also like to thank all of you who have joined us for this hearing. We are here today to examine the city's COVID-19 testing and contact tracing program, otherwise known as the T2 program. This pandemic is unlike anything we had ever seen before and has caused immeasurable hardship for our city. It has highlighted longstanding inequities based on race, socioeconomic status, religion, and immigration status which impact the health and financial stability of several communities. In order to protect New Yorkers and reduce the spread of COVID-19 as much as possible, we must have a robust, trustworthy, and culturally inclusive contact tracing program. Contact tracing encompasses several important responsibilities, such as investigating cases, tracing and monitoring contacts who have been potentially exposed to COVID-19, and ensuring individuals that are required to quarantine or isolate have access to resources and wraparound services as needed. According to its website, the contact tracing program relies on partnerships with community-based organizations, local providers, and nonprofits to provide effective culturally and linguistically appropriate services and respond to the needs of communities that have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we will build off our first T2 hearing held back in May, where we would discuss our concerns with shifting contact tracing responsibilities from DOHMH to h, &H as well as concerns about community buy-in and trust. We will examine the implementation of T2 and how well the program has enlisted the help of community-based organizations in their efforts to meet the needs of this city's incredibly diverse community. It cannot be stated any clearer. The only way we will have a successful program and therefore protect New Yorkers to the best of our abilities is if the T2 program has meaningful partnerships with CBOs and other community leaders. Many of our cities, CBOs and community leaders have trusted relationships with our city's most vulnerable communities and this trust cannot be built overnight. The importance of such relationships is highlighted by our current situation. We are currently seeing spikes in cases and for the first time in months, yesterday we reported a positivity rate of over 3%. This is incredibly concerning to me. While I know the city is now acting to ensure the communities experiencing spikes are receiving the resources they need and that they are performing meaningful outreach, it feels as if our response has been too reactionary. We should be proactively ensuring spikes such as the ones we are seeing now never happen. CBOs and community leaders are able to anticipate the needs of their communities. They do not just react to their needs. This is the expertise we should have been utilizing all along. As we had emphasized back in May, COVID cases and deaths are avoidable and we cannot continue to let our most vulnerable communities suffer. 
If community involvement and education is not improved, more lives will be put on the line. If we do not strengthen our responses, we will continue to see devastating impacts of COVID-19 on communities who have been subjected to inequities and marginalization for years. I am interested in learning about the program's collaboration with CBOs, including those which may be smaller and have less resources compared to others. I am also particularly concerned about language access and whether we are reaching traditionally hard to reach communities in their language and with appropriate messaging. For example, due to privacy concerns, we are unsure precisely how many contact tracers are fluent in Afrikaans, American Sign Language, Farsi, German, Japanese, Korean, Malay, Polish, Punjabi, and Yiddish. There have been reports that while there is a contact tracing advisory board composed of community leaders, it seems as if their concerns specifically related to data privacy have been ignored. This is particularly concerning since mistrust among communities of color and others is related to a historical legacy of mistreatment and discrimination, which have been extended to policies under this federal administration. We're also concerned about T2 data. In May 2020, the council passed introduction number 1961-2020 regarding public reporting on contact tracing for COVID-19. While the data provided by the T2 program has improved over time, there is still incomplete data in reporting that can be clarified. For example, demographic data can be improved since many people do not report their race or ethnicity. For data to accurately identify harder hit populations and communities, it is essential that it is both complete and disaggregated by all demographic categories, which it is currently not. I look forward to addressing our concerns and learning more about the work of the T2 program. I also look forward to hearing from advocates about their experiences interacting with T2, as well as the experiences of their clients. I wanna thank the members of the administration who are here testifying today. H&H &H and DOHMH have been working tirelessly for months to protect all of us. While I understand the incredibly hard work that Dr. Long and others present have put into the T2 program, I know that we all agree that we must work together to ensure the success of the program. So today if we, we can see if there are better ways for us all to collaborate. Today we will also hear a resolution, resolution 0638-2018, calling on the New York State Department of Health to create standalone self-contained isolation centers or units for the treatment of patients with infectious disease due to epidemic, including highly contagious and airborne diseases sponsored by Council Member Eugene. I look forward to hearing more from Council Member Eugene and the impact such centers would have on the health and safety of our communities in future pandemics. Thank you all again for being here and I look forward to a robust discussion. I will now turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. Really pleased to be partnering with you in today's hearing on this very important topic and pleased that we're joined by a number of colleagues, including Council Member Dr. Eugene, as you mentioned, Council Member Reynoso, Council Member Moya, Council Member Holden, Council Member Cohen, Councilmember Maisel and Councilmember Barron, as well as New York City's public advocate, Jamani Williams, who we'll be hearing from momentarily. As you mentioned, Madam Chair, today is a follow up to the hearing we held on this critical program, New York City's Test and Trace, last May, just as this program was launching. Today's hearing is taking place at a complicated moment in our battle against this virus, with cases and positivity rates rising sharply in numerous neighborhoods, the reopening this week of our schools, the resumption today of limited indoor dining and colder weather arriving soon. We need a robust program of testing and contact tracing to protect our city at this difficult moment. Thankfully, our testing capacity has expanded dramatically since the crisis days of last spring. And we are now doing on average over 30,000 tests per day. And wait times have thankfully dropped significantly since August when delays of as much as 14 days for results were not uncommon. But even today, all communities in our city are still not accessing tests equally. We need to do more to increase testing for the people at highest risk the black and brown communities at highest risk and all neighborhoods, which are now seeing a spike in cases. And the rise of antigen testing has thrown us a curveball, since many of these tests being done at point of care 
are not being reported, hindering our ability to track citywide trends. Our city's contact tracing program has also expanded significantly since our last hearing, with an encouraging increase in the rate of interview completion amongst those who test positive in their contacts. Less clear is the rate of completion of and compliance with the full period of quarantine or isolation for those who test positive or have been exposed. This is a key pillar in our fight against the second wave, and we need to better understand how well it's working. Contact tracing is becoming more challenging and even more high stakes as schools, restaurants, and other indoor ven venues reopen. I look forward to hearing about the resources and protocols we're applying to this growing challenge. Finally, I want to strongly echo Chair Rivera in saying that in the most diverse city on earth, none of this works, not the testing, tracing, or isolating, unless the people doing the work have deep cultural competence, linguistic competence, authentic roots in the frontline communities most impacted, and most important of all, the trust of the people we're serving and caring for. The challenges in the current hotspots in Brooklyn and Queens indicate that we have much more work to do to meet this goal. I wanna thank the administration for being here today and I look forward to a robust discussion with all of you on this critical topic. Thank you and back to you, Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to Council Member Eugene, who has prepared opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to thank our Chair Oliveira for her leadership of the Committee on Hospital, as well as the Health Committee Chair Levine, and all my colleagues who have supported the Resolution 638 and understand the dire situation that our city continues to face with the spread of COVID-19. We all know that uh, this horrible disease continues to pose a risk to the health of, of all New Yorkers, including long-term health issues. And it is important that we continue to work together and use all available resources to protect the New York City. Resolution 638 calls on New York State Department of Health to create a standalone self-contained isolation centers or units for the treatment of patients with infectious disease due to epidemic, including highly contagious disease like COVID-19. As we saw at the outset of this pandemic, officials of all level of government had to work expeditiously to prepare enough hospital beds for the thousand New Yorkers who became infected with COVID-19. We saw the arrival of the USNS Comfort to help accommodate an overflow of patients, as well as the, convention, the, the conversion of the Javid Center, Javid Center into a medical facility. And even the use of Central Park as field hospital to have care for the sick. We also witnessed the distress and agony of our healthcare workers who fought desperately to save life in the face of an invisible enemy. We thank and commend all our healthcare workers, first responders, essential workers, and military personnel who risked their own personal health and went above and beyond the call of duty to build facilities and care for New Yorkers and get them through this horrible pandemic. At the same time, we now understand what preventive measures must be taken in the event of a public health emergency. The need for isolation centers is long overdue so that we can contain, protect infected individuals in, more, in a more immediate manner. As uh, with uh, any infectious disease. COVID-19 can mutate and change how it is transmitted. Our country has dealt with our outbreaks of a disease in the past that we were better prepared to contain, including Ebola, H1N1, and SARS. But we are now seeing up close the severity of COVID-19 in comparison to previous outbreaks. 
we got to say that we are in a new era of infectious disease. And we must now raise our preparedness level to better protect the global community. As the national death toll exceeds 200,000 lives, we must act with a renewed sense of urgency to prepare New York City for future public health emergencies. That is why it is important to create self-contained isolation centers so that we can more readily isolate sick individuals without having to overextend city and state resources in the event of a mass hospitalization. I'm confident that the creation of this new medical infrastructure will not only pre prevent the spread of infectious disease, but also help us as a city and state to be more prepared in the event of any major public health emergency or crisis. I want to thank one more time Chair Rivera and Chair Levine and all my colleagues. And I want to thank also the legislative department and all my staff, especially Melissa Wilson for the work on this important legislation. Thank you very much, Chair Rivera. Thank you, Chair Levine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Eugene. I will now turn it over to Public Advocate Williams, who's also prepared opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams, the public advocate for the city of New York. Again, I want to thank uh, Committee on Hospitals Chair Colleen Rivera and uh, Committee on Health Chair Mark Levine for holding today's hearing, as well as Dr. Eugene for the thoughtful resolution uh, we're hearing today as well. Since our discussion on the 15th, uh, on, on May 15th, on testing and contact tracing, COVID-19 still remains a threat despite the low infection rate across the city. The recent uptick in parts of Brooklyn is a testament to this, and we see an uptick as a whole in the city uh, in the past few days. Too many people have lost their lives to the virus, and we do not need to see more deaths in the fall that could have been avoided. That is why a clear, transparent uh, plan from the administration is needed. Countries around the world have shown us how a plan to mitigate COVID-19 can succeed. In Senegal, there is a $1 testing kit, 24-hour test results, and daily and transparent reports to citizens. Officials add personal notes for each death to make sure we know more about those who have passed instead of merely calculating a statistic. In South Korea, officials rely on the three T's, test, trace, and treat. Moreover, technology is used to inform citizens as well as accommodate messages based on gender, religion, region, and other factors. These are valuable lessons that I recommend for our city officials to review. In May, Health and Hospitals CEO, Dr. Mitchell Katz testified that his agency can work with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on a joint message to the public. Three months later, Dr. Os Osiris Babo resigned from her post during one of the most important health crises in the city's history. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what she experienced as a woman Latina, uh, in this position by this administration uh, was very hard to watch and deserved of its own hearing actually. Uh, with that aside, in her view, DOHMH was best positioned to manage contact tracing based on its history of doing so. Yet this administration thought otherwise. I hope to hear concrete steps from both city health agencies to prevent a second wave. We also heard from Dr. Katz that health and hospitals can quickly hire staff, staffers, mobilize its testers, and use its resources compared to the DOHMH. Yet, in July, we read that contact tracers felt unprepared in a disorganized program. Even worse, the city's testing system could not keep up with demand. This caused delays with tests. As more students return to school, this is alarming. This is another subject, uh, another day. That the plan of the administration to reopen schools makes all of these other issues even worse. I appreciate the new lab in Manhattan to reduce with delays. However, it is clear our medical infrastructure needs improvement. The amount of personal data being stored as a part of the contact tracing program and the fact that the data is being held in an identifiable manner with no plans to destroy or anonymize it in the future presents a real danger to the privacy and protections of constituents. Contact tracing collects personal information beyond just positive test status and date information, reaching far in the context, relations, locations, habits, and lives. With this amount of data being collected, concrete plans for the protection and or removal of it should be set in place now to ensure constituents can trust and participate in the contact tracing program. 
when my office brought this up to uh, the governor's office and the mayor's office, uh, the governor gave a flippant response. Uh, the initial response of the mayor was nothing at all. I am thankful the administration has had uh, conversations with us uh, and what they were trying to do, but there's still some more that's needed to make sure that we can tell all constituents that they have nothing to worry about. So I would like New York City Test and Trace Corps and the administration to commit what I just mentioned, the type of process that we think we best please commit to it today. Furthermore, I anticipate discussion on the city's plan when a vaccine appears. I agree with the mayor that we must prepare for a vaccine, yet the state will review vaccines approved by the federal government. I share concerns about federal efforts to speed up the availability of a vaccine when people are rightfully apprehensive, especially from this administration, federal administration that has lied and provided false information since the beginning of the pandemic. There is a public-private partnership called Operation Warp Speed with $10 billion spent so far to fast track a vaccine. There is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, historically in charge of informing the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention on vaccination policy. Yet, I am worried public health experts will vary in the recommendations for the government. Outside of the federal government, but at the request of federal officials, there is a National Academy of Medicine's expert panel to determine the priority of distribution. There's also the National Medical Association's All Black Physician Task Force to vet federal decisions and recommendations on vaccines to ensure communities of more color are not forgotten. Who will the administration listen to when vaccines are released? How confident will we be if one is released this year? In these discussions, we of course must focus on the entire city, but we must also center communities of more color. They suffered the most during the worst of COVID-19 earlier this year. DOH MH data indicates this disparities still exist. The COVID-19 case rate per 100,000 residents among Black and Latinx people was about 1.5 and 1.6 times higher than white people, respectively. If there is a resurgence, we cannot see these communities disproportionately impacted again. Communities of more color should be consulted in public health strategy and conversations on testing, contact tracing, and especially a vaccine. Lastly, I'll say I know we all are very aware of the shortcomings of uh, people in the White House and the federal government. But that doesn't mean we as a city and state should not do everything we can with the power that we have uh, to make sure we get through this. We haven't seen that as of, uh, as of uh, this beginning of this pandemic. My hope is that really changes and we can have full confidence. So I look forward to this hearing today. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to speak, uh, both chairs. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams. I want to also acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Powers and Councilmember Ayala. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Senior Policy Analyst, Emily Balkin, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call our first panel of witnesses. Thank you, Chair Rivera. I'm Emily Balkin, the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Hospitals and the Committee on Health of the, of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanna go over a few procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. You will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. I will be periodically announcing the next panelist. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Here to testify is Dr. Ted Long, the Executive Director and Vice President of Ambulatory Care at New York City Testing Trace Corps. And here for Q&A from the New York City Test and Trace Corps are Jackie Bray, the Deputy Executive Director, Annabelle Palma, the Chief Equ Equity Officer, Dr. Andrew Wallach, Chief Medical Officer and Director of Testing, Dr. Neil Vora, Director of Tracing, Dr. Amanda Johnson, Director of Isolation. And here for Q&A from DOHMH is Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, the Deputy Commissioner of Disease Control. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Long? Yes. 
Thank you. Jackie Bray? Yes. Thank you. Annabelle Palmer? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Wallach? Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Vora? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Johnson? Yeah. Thank you. And Dr. Doskalak? Yes. Okay, Dr. Long, you may begin when you're ready. Okay. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chairwoman Rivera, Chairman Levine, members of the Committee on Hospitals and Committee on Health. I am Dr. Ted Long, the Executive Director of the Test and Trace Corps and Senior Vice President for Ambulatory Care at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm joined today by the leaders of the Test and Trace Corps, Jackie Bray, Deputy Executive Director, and Annabelle Palma, Chief Equity Officer. Also present this morning are Dr. Andrew Wallach, Chief Medical Officer and Director of Testing, Dr. Neil Vora, Director of Tracing, Dr. Amanda Johnson, Director of Isolation or Take Care, and Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control at the Health Department. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on New York City's plan for COVID-19 testing and contact tracing. The Test and Trace Corps launched on June 1st with an imperative to test, trace, and take care of every New Yorker who tests positive for COVID-19 or may have come into contact with someone with COVID-19. We were informed of positive COVID-19 results or cases. Then we rapidly track and monitor contacts who were exposed to COVID-19 and manage all cases and contact data. We work with each person who has COVID-19 to connect them immediately to care and help them safely isolate at home, a hotel, or a hospital, and ensure their contacts are swiftly traced, assessed, and quarantined at, a, at home or hotel as necessary. To reach as many positive COVID-19 cases as possible, the Test and Trace Corps has deployed a subset of case investigators that are solely responsible for conducting database research and directly reaching out to doctor's offices to track down cases and contacts for whom we initially do not have a phone number. The Test and Trace Corps is also working with a wide range of community-based organizations across all boroughs to broaden its outreach to contacts who may have been unresponsive to phone calls through our Hit Accept campaign. In addition, the Test and Trace Corps operates the Take Care Initiative, the city's program to help all New Yorkers safely separate to prevent the spread of the virus. Our Take Care program provides free hotel rooms with wraparound services for New Yorkers who are unable to safely separate in their homes and supports those who are safely who are separating a home with dedicated resource navigators. Through partnerships with 11 community-based organizations across the city, the Test and Trace Corps employs resource navigators that help New Yorkers overcome logistical issues they may encounter while safely separating in their homes, such as access to basic services like food, medicine, and laundry. To date, we have 220 resource navigators on the ground helping and have helped uh, 16,735 New Yorkers quarantine safely, whether it be in their home or through hotel support. New Yorkers with COVID-19 are also connected to a comprehensive range of support services, such as grocery delivery to help them isolate at home. To help all New Yorkers safely separate at home and monitor their health status, the Test and Trace Corps contact tracers check in with families via daily calls, text messages, and conduct in-person visits as necessary. These calls and texts allow us to gauge the progress of COVID-19 cases and contacts ensure proper compliance with separation protocol, and connect individuals to more supportive services as necessary. Thus far, we've been able to reach 90% of all COVID cases across New York City, continuing to meet and mostly now surpassing our program goal that we set up since mid-June, um, since after we launched on June 1st. For New Yorkers isolating outside of their home at our isolation hotel, they receive transportation to and from the hotels, meals, wellness checks, support services, home health coordination, and home care for up to 14 days. Since the launch of Test and Trace Corps, 1,350 New Yorkers have been served through our hotel program. 
At the hotel, meals, clean clothes, and medication refills for anyone who is isolated and quarantined is provided for those who require assistance. Using telemedicine, health and hospitals also performs remote medical checks on those in isolation and quarantine and evaluates individuals to determine whether they should receive care at a hospital or not. In August, the Take Care program began shipping Take Care packages to New Yorkers who test positive for COVID-19 and contacts of confirmed positive cases. Take Care packages include a medical grade mask, sanitation wipes, hand sanitizer, a pulse oximeter, and a thermometer. To date, we have shipped 8,744 packages to New Yorkers. Earlier this month, the Test and Trace Corps also launched the city's first brick and mortar location within a house of worship. The city is now partnering with the Episcopal Church of St. Alban the Martyr to expand COVID-19 testing sites in Queens while serving communities of color hardest hit by the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, with Black and Latino New Yorkers dying around twice the rate of white counterparts when adjusted for age. Since the launch of Test and Trace Corps, over 450 field-based contact tracers have been deployed to communities across the city, with a particular emphasis on those hardest hit by COVID-19 to engage, check in, and gather contacts of confirmed COVID-positive cases. Community engagement specialists also spend time in communities speaking with those contacts who might have been exposed to the virus. Tracers we call case investigators support their efforts, working remotely and focusing their time on conducting calls to New Yorkers with a positive COVID-19 result. Together with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, we have developed and implemented nimble hyperlocal responses to swiftly engage communities hardest hit by COVID-19. So far, hyperlocal efforts have been rolled out in Tremont, Bronx, Sunset Park, Brooklyn, Soundview, Bronx, Borough Park, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and Ozone Park in Southeast Queens. Through this, the city is providing $10 million in grants to community-based organizations ranging from $50,000 to $750,000 in these areas to encourage communities they serve to get tested and engage with contact tracing. In these communities, on-site resource navigators are stationed at rapid testing sites across the community to immediately connect people with services, including hotel rooms if needed. The city is also providing $7.8 million for community-based organizations to promote public awareness around COVID-19 and test and trace core services. These 39 community-based organizations serve low-income and vulnerable communities across the five boroughs at increased risk of contracting COVID-19. Additionally, to ensure the test and trace core can meet the diverse needs of New Yorkers from all backgrounds, 40 distinct languages are spoken by tracers in our program today. We have surpassed our hiring goals, meeting our milestone prior to the completion of our first month. The test and trace score has recruited, trained, and hired over 3,600 contact tracers with the advisement and expertise from 40 of the Department of Health's experienced contact tracers. Together, we manage and ensure the high quality of uh, effective remote and field-based contact tracer teams. There have also been many operational achievements since quickly coming up to speed to serve the city's uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. New York City Health and Hospitals has been able to successfully conduct 450,000 COVID-19 tests since mid-April and currently operating with the capacity to uh, test approximately 60,000 people per day in New York City with plans to expand that capacity further in the next few weeks. Currently, we are, we are, currently we are testing between 20 and 40,000 people per day citywide. Our contact tracing efforts have been impressive. We're proud to say that those we have engaged, 96% of cases and 93% of contacts report to us every day not having left their home. These percentages are significant when it comes to ensuring that New Yorkers are doing all they can to curb local transmission. The test and trace core is now reaching 90% of all COVID cases citywide every day surpassing our initial benchmark goals. Nearly five months since the program's launch, COVID-19 visits to the emergency departments, case numbers, hospitalizations, deaths, and test positivity have been at their lowest since the epidemic began. All of our progress can be monitored and tracked by all New Yorkers for free and in real time through our Test and Trace Core dashboard. The dashboard is readily available on our website and is updated weekly. In doing this, we are able to help all New Yorkers feel safer in their city and demonstrate that our efforts are actually working together with them. 
The test and trace core is committed to ensuring that every New Yorker can access free and confidential testing, receive the care they need, and safely isolate to combat any further transmission. Through our robust and citywide partnerships, we will continue working with City Council to educate and help New Yorkers fight COVID-19. Besides getting tested, we want to remind all New Yorkers to follow the core four. Stay at home if you're sick, wear a mask, social distance, and keep your hands clean. Again, thank you for your time this morning and the opportunity to speak on this program. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Long. I will now turn over to Chair Rivera for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to just acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Amprey Samuel. So I guess let's start with, well, thank you for your testimony. I, I appreciate um, what you've gone over. I guess we want to get into some of the details. Uh, I know you've informed us of cases, tracking and monitoring contacts who were exposed and managing all of those cases and that contact data. Uh, hit accept the take care program the 90 percent contact rate it all sounds very good but can you discuss how you measure success what data are you using to show that the program is working i know you mentioned the dashboard but later on in the hearing we're we're, we're going to at least ask you on the record um, for more disaggregated data that gets into super super fine detail but can you discuss how you measure success and what data do you use to show that the program is actually working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. Um, I'll note that uh, the metrics I'm about to share with you, we put these out publicly because they're the right thing to do before we hit them and actually before we were uh, in some cases um, even close to hitting them. Uh, this was months ago now. So we know from uh, models that have been done, so evidence-based, and the consensus of experts that there are a few key things you must do to keep the virus suppressed and to drive down virus levels across the city. Number one is you have to be reaching um, enough people. Number two, and we set the bar at 90% there. Number two, and models show this uh, percentage specifically, is that you need to be uh, for 75% of your new cases, completing interviews with them and getting them to isolate. And then number three, is you need to, for contacts, also be getting them to quarantine. You need to be interviewing and completing interviews with 75% of them as well and getting them to quarantine. Let me walk you through a couple of data points about where we are right now. With respect to people that we we're reaching, when we started the program, we were not, we didn't even have phone numbers for 90% of people. Um, but now, through not, uh, uh, evolving our program, knocking on people's doors, we're consistently reaching more than 90% of all new cases. There's no qualifying that denominator. It's of everybody that gets diagnosed with coronavirus across New York City, because that's what matters. Number two, in terms of the peep of new cases, we're now completing interviews consistently with more than 75% of them, which was the benchmark we set out before we were, uh, before we certainly hit the metric. Um, and, uh, but since then, we've really had a laser focus on that. And I'm proud that we have worked really hard and have hit that metric. And then of those cases too, I'd mentioned the important thing is getting them to isolate so they don't go out there and infect up to 2.5 other New Yorkers each. 96 and now 97% of all of our new cases are confirming with us day by day on the phone that they are isolating. So the metric is real, they are isolating. Um, and then the third metric is one where um, Chairwoman Rivera was still working on it. So for contacts, we need to be completing interviews with 75% of them. Right now, we're a bit north of 60%. That is an area where we need to do more work. Um, we have several strategies that we're implementing now, which we're happy to go into more detail for, um, but we need to get to 75% for that. And that's been, again, one of the metrics we set out before we hit it, and we haven't hit it yet. And that's a key area of focus for us. Okay, and so in terms of, you know, you mentioned it in your testimony, we know that Latino and Black New Yorkers are, are dying at twice the rate of their white counterparts. So I wanna ask about in all of this work in terms of equity, uh, we know that we need to have people that look like the community, that have trusted relationships, talking to Latino and Black New Yorkers. So do hiring practices reflect this reality? And 
specifically, I want to ask about language services. I know you mentioned there are about 40 languages spoken by the tracers, but I want to be very, very specific in terms of do your hiring practices reflect the reality of that two to one uh, number? And, and again, specifically, I wanted to ask about Haitian and Caribbean communities. Many of them in Brooklyn and across the city feel like there is not enough outreach done to those particular groups. So can you speak to that as well? Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn to our chief equity officer, Annabelle Palma, to share her thoughts as well. So um, three parts to your question. First is, um, uh, do our tracers represent our communities? Second is languages. And third is, in particular, um, the Haitian community and have we, what's our, been our strategy for engaging with them? Um, so the first part of your question around do our tracers represent our communities? If I had to tell you what our secret ingredient is for how we've achieved, hit our benchmarks, I really truly believe it is because we have hired the right people. We've hired New Yorkers to help New Yorkers. Well over half of all of our tracers are not only, almost all of them are from New York City, but well over half are from our hardest hit communities, meaning they live through the horrors that we all live through in March and April in their communities. So when they're knocking on the door of somebody in their community, nobody gets it. Nobody knows what that person went through better than they do because they went through the same thing in March and April. Even this morning, I was on the phone with one of our tracers. I make a point of talking to our tracers as much as I can to get a sense of what they're, uh, how we can make improvements to the program. Um, and this gentleman uh, happened to be from Borough Park. So we talked about uh, what's going on there a little bit. He uh, shared with me, he said, you know, Dr. Long, I have to tell you, um, we would not be effective at all if we didn't actually represent the communities we came from. Uh, he said, nobody understands Borough Park like I do or like people that are there uh, from there do. Nobody outside of, of Borough Park even could really get through to that community. And I think he's probably right. And I think that, that uh, the, our ability to really get through to people um, and engage them with the program and then they actually isolate and quarantine speaks to our success there and our tracers being the right people. I won't belabor that point further. Um, your second question was around languages. So our tracers speak more than 40 languages, and in particular, our tracers that make our monitoring phone calls. Um, I think well over a third, I think it's close to 40% now, um, are bilingual. Um, and then I'll give you an example of why this matters to me. So um, in some of our communities, and you alluded to this a little bit, Chairman Rivera, in your, in your comments earlier, um, we've seen upticks. And in particular, these are communities um, that we know uh, have uh, had a very hard time through COVID back in March and April as well look at Sunset Park, look at Soundview. We saw upticks in both of those communities. So what we did, and I'll give you the example of Soundview here, because I actually visited the site myself and saw it happening, um, is uh, when you have a rapid test, if it comes back positive, um, you have a team there of tracers in person that speak the seven languages of that community that will do immediate instantaneous contact tracing with you. So instead of talking about our completion rate being 75% or whatever, it's 100% there. Well, it was 100% because they, they get you right there and they speak your language. Um, I practice primary care not far from that community, and I know um, the language is spoken there by that community. And I think that was a very, your point's very well taken. The way that we were successful there is because we had people that spoke the language of the community who were from the community. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, I just want to just want to ask about that. I, I know that the language is going to be critical. I mean, you can go to Elmhurst Hospital any day and there might be a hundred languages spoken there alone. Yeah. So that I, I, I totally understand. I just wanted to ask about, you know, serving some of the communities that were the hardest hit. And I know that we were going to hear from uh, Ms. Palma in a second, but let me just ask you about, because uh, I know that my colleagues have questions as well. And, and I also, Chair Levine will be asking a bunch of questions. What is the current distribution of tests dispensed and contract tracers per number of residents in each zip code in New York City? Assuming you have the language <clears throat> that is serving those neighborhoods, if you can just answer that. The current distribution of tests dispensed and contact tracers per number of residents in each zip code in New York City, and does it reflect the granular case positivity rates in each zip code? Mm -hmm. Great question. So let me just repeat it back to you to make sure that um, we can look up the data right in front of us here now. Um, then I'm going to turn to Annabelle to give uh, my team a second to pull this together because we have it. Um, so the first part is around testing. We, uh, we have data on as we've opened sites, where we've opened them and how that's been guided by uh, race, ethnicity, and community need. Um, so we're going to pull that for you in a moment. I'm going to look to Jackie Bray to share that if she has it. 
Um, and if not, if Dr. Wallach does. Um, and then the second part of your question was around contact tracers. I said to you that well over half of our contact tracers uh, were from our hardest hit communities, which represent um, obviously um, a, a portion of, New of the New York City population. So they're disproportionately represented there. Um, I could tell, I could say that to you for certain, um, but if we have the percentage we could pull together right now, uh, we will, otherwise we can get back to you even by the end of the day with that. Um, but Annabelle, um, so can I turn to you both to weigh in on all of these issues? In particular, I wanted to be sp uh, specific about um, the Haitian Creole communities that Count, um, Chairwoman Rivera was talking about as well. Sure, um, thank you, Dr. Long. Um, good morning, I'm Che Rivera and members of the council. Um, as Dr. Long had mentioned, we are um, dedicated to making sure that we are serving the communities in, you know, the um, languages um, that they are mostly comfortable in speaking. Um, we, he mentioned we had um, gone to Soundview. We've also have gotten, um, have gone to Sunset Park. We have um, dedicated, um, ensuring that materials are translated um, in the languages um, that are most effective um, for the message to reach um, particular communities. I know that when we were doing our hyperlocal um, focus on Soundview, one of the languages that was missing was the Haitian Creole um, language. Um, and we, quick, we were able to quickly turn around materials um, and get folks on board to help us um, communicate with, with, that, um, with that particular um, population. We've been um, focusing on um, strengthening our partnerships with our CBOs who are in these communities and know um, and have you know, their pulse on, on the community um, that, and, and what the community needs are we um, have been invited um, and continue to be invited to speak um, to communities um, via WebEx um, town hall meetings or um, through um, the local community boards. And we always ensure that um, we're again, doing it in, in specific um, languages. I know that I today have done over 30 WebEx um, in, in Spanish, um, getting the information out to those individuals um, and answering the questions again in, in their appropriate languages. And, and we will continue um, to do that as we move our program, our program along. Um, but again, right, it's crucial, the partnerships that we build um, with those community-based organizations to allow us to continue to do the work that needs to be done and, and to continue to um, flag for us um, what else we need to be doing to ensure that communities are not feeling like they're being left out. Are you working with, with Moya, with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, specifically the Office of Language Services Coordinator for those communities who may not be represented well by tracers? So for example, uh, the languages with less than five speakers. Are you working with with that agency? Absolutely, we do a lot of um, we we do a lot of the um, community meetings and um, town halls together along with Moya. Moya flags for us many of the meetings that we have um, that that our team um, has attended um, since the startup of um, the Test and Trace Corps, and so we we work closely with them. Um, to ensure that we are hitting all those communities. And when will disaggregated data by language, zip code, et cetera, be available for contact tracers? I guess I also wanna ask, the, can test and trace and, and DOHMH disclose racially and ethnically dis disaggregated data on contact tracing and COVID mortality and morbidity to the public? Can, I, I know that Dr. Long can answer that um, more specifically in terms of when we are able um, to share that, that 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 data. That data is being worked on, and, and we you know we can pull it together and definitely share it um, with the council once we pull it together. Okay, and can you also include subgroups to be disaggregated in the same way and publicly available? For example, 
of age, uh, whether the person lives in public housing, language use, the language that you used and the language that was needed. I think that's all gonna be really, really important in terms of transparency for the public so we can build that trust considering the history of, of how certain communities have been underserved when it comes to, to health care and medical services. So I, I want to make sure that I, I actually want to turn it over to Chair Levine. I want to make sure he gets a, a chance to ask questions. And then we have quite a few council members who I think want to drill down on, on some of this data that we've requested that is currently not available. Chair Levine? Yeah, well, Chairwoman Rivera, can we um, take, would you mind if we took one second to answer your data question for the tracers? Um, like you said you have to get it to me later. But, I, okay. I appreciate I'll, I'll have a better answer. Uh, well, I tell you what, we have part of it now, and then I may get you the, the second part later. But I'm going to turn to Jackie to share what we have now. Jackie. And Jackie. You ah, there we go. Now I can. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. So um, I just wanted to say in terms of tracers and how we allocate their resources throughout the day, they're allocated based on cases. Right, so the more cases a community has, the more tracers that will be deployed into um, that community. So that's how we do that. Um, in terms of the data that you're requesting, we already, I just wanna make sure everyone knows where to find the data that's already being released, right? So we already release um, data uh, on the zip codes of where our tracers are from. So you can see that on our website. Um, once a week, every week. We already release data on um, the race and ethnicity data that is available through tracing. It is absolutely true that um, people can decline to answer those questions. And so it's not a complete data set and it doesn't represent every single person's case, um, but it is as complete as we have. We're not keeping any of that data. You have all of the data we have on that. Um, I also, in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality, want to point you to the health department's website. Um, DOHMH has been posting mortality statistics since I think the end of March, um, at least. Um, and the, that is disaggregated by race and ethnicity. And so that's not that type of data, mortality data or fatality data is not the type of data that the test and trace core would maintain or would track, that's really the type of data that you'd wanna to go to the health department's website for. I think the data that we're gonna get back to you on is how many, um, test, how many tests are collected specifically by the resources that the city is using by neighborhood or by zip code. Um, the data of how many people are tested by neighborhood is, has been public um, from, from the get-go and that is freely available on the Department of Health's website. So I just wanna be clear that a lot of the data is already out there um, and, and happy to think about how we can get you different data or better data or drill down or cross tabs, but a lot of the data is already getting posted. I would just say, I, I think it's released by race. I don't, I don't believe it's race and zip code, but I can go back and check and, and we don't know how many positive cases by zip code and race. That's what we mean by disag disaggregate. So we're looking for that really broken down as well as incorporating some of the other factors I mentioned, and then clearly you're working very closely with DOHMH. So having that kind of compiled together instead of having to pull from different websites to me makes a lot more sense to have something comprehensively. But I'm gonna go ahead, I'm, I just wanna thank you for answering that question. I'm looking forward to kind of the outstanding data that you mentioned. And uh, again, just turn it over to Chair Levine. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chair Rivera for that excellent line of questioning. And I just wanna follow up on one important point you raised. Um, uh, and Dr. Long, great to see you and the team. Um, uh, Dr. Long, could you just remind us how many total contact tracers you currently have working? Uh, a bit north of 3,600. And how many of them are Yiddish speakers? Uh, Yiddish speakers, uh, I'll have to double check the data. It's, uh, it's a handful right now, so we're aggressively hiring more. Uh, your website says, uh, has an asterisk next to the number of Yiddish speakers, which I understand means between zero and five. Is that correct? Yes. And can you not, can you not tell us where, where in that range of zero to five? We don't, the reason we don't go between zero and five is, um, it could be potentially identifying. So this is, uh, 
we, we use that asterisk for a variety of categories, not just for language. Um, but what I can, when we surpass five, we'd be happy to share that with you right away. Well, the, the fact that we're even parsing whether it's one, two, or three out of a workforce of 3,600, considering the current preponderance of cases in affected communities in Brooklyn is, is really a problem. It, it yeah. reflects a failure to adapt to the cultural needs, the linguistic needs of this community. We, we, we have got to hire up amongst people who have relationships and trusts in the communities that are now experiencing the surge. And uh, Yiddish speaking ability is just one obvious way we need to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so so please, please report back to us on your progress on that. Absolutely. You talked about uh, a testing capacity, which is greatly expanded, which is really good news, up to 60,000. Yet uh, in recent days, we're testing only about 30,000 or so people a day. So why, why, why the discrepancy between our capacity and the amount of tests being performed? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've all, our mantra has always been that we want every New Yorker to be able to get a fast, close, convenient, and free test um, wherever you live. So that's why we've worked very hard to build up our capacity to give everybody that opportunity. Um, what we're doing now to drive up our testing numbers, which is important because testing is the first step to contact tracing, is focusing in on where we see, especially these upticks, and really leveraging a lot of the capacity that you're referring to there to bring people in to be tested. So that's something that we're working very, very hard on now. We're converging um, 11 of our mobile units, for example, the majority of our fleet in the zip codes where we're seeing the uptick now, and we're doing a variety of other things to drive up the testing levels um, in those communities in particular. But our capacity allows us to be flexible and to move where we need to, where we need to be. There's a uh, continuing disparity in the rates of testing between communities, particularly uh, whiter and wealthier neighborhoods, which are testing at higher rates than low income communities and, and black and brown communities throughout the city. Uh, you actually you actually list these numbers by zip code on your website over the past month and it shows that in a place like Brooklyn Heights, you have 12,000 uh, 12, tests per 100,000 residents done over the past month. In a place like West Harlem, in my district, it's 7,000 per 100,000 residents over the past month. How do you explain that disparity and what are you doing to close that gap? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, within Test and Trace Corps, within the Health and Hospitals umbrella, control a certain portion of the actual testing sites. Other sites like CityMD existed before we came about. Um, so what we are doing is when we build new sites, whether it's a mo where we send our mobile sites or a new brick and mortar site, we look into everything you just said in terms of guiding us where we need to go. Additional factors we take into place is our, we have a very um, expert and active community advisory board. And we ask them, if we need to go in this community, this is where the data is guiding us, where should we go? Well, which corner should we go to? And actually in Sunset Park, a good example of that is there was a need to your point of doing more testing in that community for sure. Um, and we've asked our community advisory board, we actually set up one of our mobile units on the exact literal like one foot of pavement that they said is the best place to be. Um, so what we are doing to be very concrete is we're putting all of our resources in terms of where we deploy them to, to fill the gaps that you just, um, I, I think articulated very nicely. This has been a persistent problem throughout this whole pandemic. Uh, people with resources have just had easier access to tests and uh, it's, it's, it's profound inequality at its worst, and we have to do more to close that gap, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for the black and brown communities who have endured such a, a, a terrible blow throughout this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask about antigen testing, which does offer the exciting prospects of quicker and potentially cheaper testing, which we so very much need for the next phase. But it appears there's a problem in that the systems for reporting results from antigen, antigen testing are not rock solid, that some providers who have their own machines aren't reporting into the state system. Uh, what Can you estimate what percent of antigen test results are getting reported in? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So just to back up and then I'm gonna turn to Dr. Daskalakis to go into more detail here. Um, to be clear, any tests, any point of care or rapid test, be it a lateral flow antigen or be it a point of care, um, like the Abbott ID now, which is a one of the machines that we use, which is not an antigen test. Um, any of those tests need to be reported in and that's how we do contact tracing. Um, so there's a requirement that they need to be reported in. And I will turn to Dr. Daskalakis to share more about how that works. And if we have any thoughts about how big uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Long, and thank you, Council, uh, Councilman Levine. So uh, uh, we have actually provided a, a significant amount of technical guidance to providers with a recent health alert to make sure that they were aware of how to report antigen tests in the state eclair system. So as a provider who do, does see patients as well, I can tell you that eclairs is something new to people. Um, it's not something that we that providers generally use. So we're really uh, deeply diving into technical assistance. Um, as well as working with the state to make sure that their assistance uh, and their messaging to providers is adequate in terms of how to report these uh, point of care tests. Um, one of our uh, problems is that we only know about tests that are reported, not about tests that aren't reported. So I can't give you a percentage or an idea of a constellation of how many uh, <clears throat> folks are not uh, submitting these test results, but I mean, we are definitely seeing antigen tests coming in, which I think means uh, that uh, we have made the messages getting through. Obviously, always more work to do in provider education and outreach, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Dr. Daskalakis. Um, Dr. Long, you you talked, uh, you gave us significant detail about uh, contact tracing results, mm -hmm. um, and we appreciate that. One point I just want to clarify. What percent of people that you interview are giving at least one contact? Yeah, so um, I, let me pull that up here. I believe the answer is 71%. My team can confirm that in a moment. Um, one of the things that we've done um, to fully answer your question, though, is we also ask people um, if the reason they're not giving us the contact is they don't want to, or if they genuinely don't have any contacts, because as you know, in theory, in a perfect system, people should have no contacts. So um, part of the, uh, uh, the, the we've, we've added those questions to understand what the real problem there is. And I'm gonna turn to Jackie in a moment, but I believe that the statistic is that 13% of people when we ask don't give us contacts. And it's, it's neither because they don't, they uh, they say they don't have one or, nor because they've given us one. It, it's, it's because they don't want to, or they don't feel like they, um, they don't feel encouraged to. But Jackie, did I get those numbers right? And you want to share more? Hi. Yes. Yeah, so 70, 71% is right. 71% of folks who, um, who we talk to do provide a contact, um, at least one contact. And then of the 29% who don't, 55% of that group report having no contacts. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is truly a small amount of people uh, yeah, 14%, 13, 14% of folks who, um, who both report, verbally report no contacts, but also tell us they have a close contact that they're not willing to report to us. Okay, obviously we want to, we want every single person who tests positive to share their contacts. We know that requires a, a leap of trust uh, and it's why we have to continue to be out there making the case and, and building those relationships. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you. I, I wonder if you can share with us uh, kind, of, kind of a big question. Where is spread occurring to the extent you're able to track it? Is it occurring at home amongst households? Is it occurring uh, in, in public settings like mass transit? Uh, is it occurring uh, in, in illicit events like uh, house parties? We've seen those kinds of reporting out of other cities around the world and even some in the US. Um, tell us the picture here in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna turn to uh, both Drs. Daskulakis and Dr. Bora and Jackie uh, to share more about what our, where our data is exactly leading us now. So big picture, we see where cases are coming in from. So for example, there, one of the reasons why we've had a focus on travelers that have spent time in other states that have uh, high levels of COVID now is we know that one in every five new cases has been uh, from somebody that's traveled to another one of those states. 
Um, in terms of where transmission is happening here, and we can give you the example of what we saw at Sunset Park, where the percent of people testing positive uh, was up to 4.2%. We did exhaustive analyses looking at, is it community transmission? Are there any um, focal sites? Um, and what we're seeing a lot of is, again, community transmission, a transmission among family members. Um, I'm gonna turn now to go into more detail. Let's start with um, Dr. Vork. Thank you. Uh, so transmission, like Dr. Long was saying, is occurring in a variety of different settings, as we can imagine. And this is an imperfect science, right? Because we, we have to make some assumptions about where someone might have gotten infected. And, and we, in many instances, we'll never know for sure. But like Dr. Long was saying, a large proportion is happening within households because that's the, the most common source of contact that a person will have. Uh, some of these new cases do report that, in fact, they were in contact with someone who was sick. And so that, that establishes that chain of transmission more clearly. But other examples of where transmission might be occurring are among essential workers, because these are people who are going out to their work. Sometimes they, they do not have the luxury of being able to work from home, given the nature of their job. So we have seen transmission under those circumstances. Uh, some proportion is happening in people who are going to gatherings and events, whether indoor or outdoor. And again, though, it, it's very hard to determine for sure that transmission definitively happened from this person to the next person, just given the nature of how widespread COVID is, even in a lower setting of transmission like we are in New York City right now, it still takes some, um, some, some conjecture based on the, the information that we have. It would be really helpful for the public to get an accounting of that because it will inform people's decisions. And I think it will help us understand um, the impact of reopening steps, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Today we have uh, another milestone with indoor dining service being permitted at 25%. Uh, this may be a question for Dr. Long. Are you tracing in cases in which, say, a server tests positive or a patron tests positive in that setting? Mm -hmm. Great question. I'm going to broaden it a little bit, if I may, because I, I know where you're going with this, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Dastalakis. Um, so we look at facilities and how we identify and detect clusters in, in a couple of sophisticated ways. Indoor dining is one of many examples of the type of settings we look at with the information we get either from contact tracing or from things like our SAT scan, which is an underlying analytic program that does geospatial um, evaluation for new cases over time. Um, Dimitri, do you want to share um, specifically indoor dining, but generally how we look at facilities clusters? Great. No, yeah, this is a perfect uh, way to sort of give an example around facilities in general. And, and I, I think it will also demonstrate what the flow of data is between uh, test and trace and DOHMH to really create what is, in effect, a assembly line of contact tracing. It ends up working kind of like that. So, um, so when a, an individual um, is identified uh, to uh, have a association with the facility, such as a restaurant, so let's say that an individual is diagnosed with COVID, they're interviewed by test and trace, uh, they say, I work at a restaurant, or I, I was at a restaurant, um, this then goes to our uh, facilities team that interacts very closely with the test and trace team. Uh, the facilities team um, then does an investigation and will notify the restaurant. Um, part of that will be to see sort of what level of, of engagement is necessary. Do we need a list of folks who are at the restaurant? If it's an employee, when was, when was that person working? What were that person's close contacts? So in effect, um, just like all of our facilities, when identified as a facility exposure, um, we do the same, we will do the same for restaurants as we do for others. Including of course schools, and maybe you could say a word about the protocols there, because it's very much on our minds this week. Yes, thank, thank you for asking about that. Um, so schools build off of um, everything that uh, Dr. Daskalakis was talking about and have a few other enhancements on top. Um, I'm going to start and then uh, see if uh, Jackie Bray wants to add anything on here about our situation room. So in schools, we have a situation room that brings together, to use Dimitri's words, the assembly line approach of how data flows and how we really all do work together across the city. If you go there today, we're all literally in the same situation room with defined responsibilities and a defined flow of things so that we know if there's a positive case in a school, that's a student or a teacher, that pod We'll go in quarantine for two weeks. That's the golden rule that will happen 100% of the time. We'll additionally do contact tracing on top of that to see if there are any other close contacts 
for that student or teacher. Then if there's another case that happens in a school, um, that's where the situation room gets activated further and DOHMH does an investigation to essentially determine if there's transmission potentially going on in the school. If there is, that will be a reason for us to have that school switch to remote learning for two weeks. Or if there's not, and it's pretty clear where each of those respective cases contracted the coronavirus, then we can reopen the school safely. But in either case, um, the, the pods are going to be quarantined uh, for two weeks regardless. Uh, Jackie, anything you want to add there? And then we're happy to go into more detail for you, Council Member Levine. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, the Situation Room is really working, I think, quite well. Um, the, we've, we're co-located, T2, DOHMH, DOE. Um, we, and we're sort of being hosted by the Department of Buildings and very grateful for their support. Um, we've identified 202 cases amongst um, DOE students or personnel that, uh, of which 105 needed a intervention. 105 of the 202 were physically in the building at some point during their infectious period. And so they needed a classroom closure or a building closure. We've been able to execute all of those um, rapidly uh, and tracing begins in the room. In the room, we have teams calling through close contacts, talking to cases um, and making sure that that data gets appropriately over to our um, larger team and our larger so system. So happy to take more granular questions. Um, but we are, uh, we are all very, very focused on keeping, uh, on robust testing and tracing in the schools and keeping these schools safe. Thank you. We're anxious to pass it off to our colleagues. So one final question, uh, very brief. I think this is the ultimate measure of uh, the success of contact tracing. How many of the newly identified cases that test positive are known to you as contacts? Mm -hmm. So I'll start and then um, we're, we're, we can get you a, a more comprehensive answer um, analytic, what using um, uh, the analytics that we're doing, uh, if not now, potentially a little, a little bit later to today or on that too. Um, so around almost a quarter of our new cases um, were contacts that developed symptoms that became cases. And that's one of the big reasons why you do this is in that case, if, if those, those contacts were already in our program where we were talking to them when they were developing symptoms. So we're able to get them to intervene, to get them to isolate immediately. And that makes a substantial difference. Uh, so your point is very well taken there. Um, we're combining that number together with uh, the other cases that otherwise were known to our program aside from being symptomatic contacts. Um, I'll turn to Dr. Vora and Jackie if they wanna share more there. And otherwise we are, we're happy to circle back with something more comprehensive on that. But I just wanna give you a flavor. Yeah, uh, like Dr. Long is saying, for, for contact tracing, we're, we're trying to establish chains of transmission. And as many of the cases that newly occur that are among known contacts is, is a good sign, right? And so it's very important that we are monitoring contacts. And then when they become symptomatic, that we start managing them as cases. And this is what Dr. Long was referring to. We also have had a, a number of pop-up test sites around the city that have, have been placed strategically in parts of the city where we are seeing perhaps an uptick in percent positivity. And in those pop-up test sites where there's rapid testing under the same roof, we've actually also stationed our contact tracers. So right then and there in real time, we can begin accelerated contact tracing. So we identify a case in person with the clinician and our contact tracer is right there to continue the conversation and identify contacts of that case. And we are in neighborhoods. These are hyper-local responses and our contact tracer in that same moment then reaches out to those contacts and encourages them to come by and get tested because they're all often in the same neighborhood. And we had very good success with getting those contacts identified on the very same day coming around to get tested with rapid testing. So these are some of the strategies we're using to encourage testing of, of contacts, which is really important. Thank you, Dr. Vora. And, and thanks to everyone from the administration. Uh, appreciate your answers. And I'm gonna pass it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now ask the moderator to call on my colleagues for questions for the administration. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Um, we're first going to turn it over to Councilmember Eugene. Councilmember Eugene, do you have questions that you would like to ask? Um, Councilmember Eugene, you are not currently unmuted. Uh, let's give you. 
Oh, there uh, you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. You may thank be. You I want to thank one more time uh, the chair, uh, the two chairs for the wonderful job and their leadership on this very important issue. And I want to thank also all the panelists. Uh, I got a few questions, but I'm going to answer just one or two right now. We know that uh, that uh, every time that we do testing for any type of disease, any type of test, test, testing, there are always false, false positive and false negative. We may think that it's positive, it's not positive, it's negative because of manipulation, because of any condition. So my question is, uh, 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 in, what is in place uh, for uh, uh, when uh, you know, the, 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 the people who are entering the testing, when they have a, a patient who is tested negative, especially negative, is there any other fa follow-up, a clinical follow-up, or, or x-ray, or radio x-ray, or any other thing to ensure that uh, we minimize the, 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 the Council member Eugene, I, I think you're breaking up a little bit. I'm not the only one, right? Okay. There, are, there is some technical difficulties. I think we might have to um, mute council member Eugene and come back to him. Um, so we can turn it over to other council members. Um, so thank you again. So as a reminder, um, if a council member would like to ask a question, they have not already done so, they can use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, council members will, keep, will need to keep their questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and you should begin once I call on you. And once the sergeant has announced that you may begin. So we will now hear questions from council, Mem council member Barron, followed by council member Amphrey Samuel and council member Reynoso. Council member Barron, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to the chairs for holding this very timely and extremely hearing on such a critical topic as what we're doing in preparation for what we're doing now to address the circumstances we have and in preparation for the um, research. Now we talked about a lot of the data and I am sure that you know that district 11239, which is basically Starrett City has been cited as the number one zip code in terms of deaths when they use the ratio and the formula for mortality. You're talking about hyperlocal, hyperlocal, hyperlocal. Tell me what you are doing in zip code 11239 specifically that relates to preparation for this resurgence. Mm -hmm. So th uh, this is Ted, I'll start. I, I appreciate that question. Um, I'm going to back up for a moment, just that we use the word hyperlocal a lot, but I, I'd like to just explain what it means, because then um, I wanted to potentially ask for your partnership. So hyperlocal is where we identify that relative to other parts of New York City, um, there are a, a variety of different issues going on, whether it's a, a higher number of proportional cases, whether it's a higher proportion of people testing positive, or whether it's less people getting tested in general. Um, uh, or a combination thereof. In Sunset Park, to give the example there, when we went to Sunset Park, what we found that 4.2% of residents there were testing positive, and they didn't have enough testing to begin with. So what we did is we brought in our mobile units, our rapid testing machines, created a, a lot of community-based partnerships, which I think was the secret ingredient there. And we were able to drive down the percent of people testing positive by more than two thirds. We then went to Soundview because we were seeing issues as you're describing there as well. 
same identical result. We drove down the percentage of people testing positive in Soundview, which is near where I practice primary care, by two thirds. In your community, the secret ingredient would be the same. Um, if we're seeing signals that that's where we need to apply more testing, for example, we'd wouldn't want to build signal be the data of what we already know has occurred. Wouldn't that be a signal? I mean, you're talking about going out and trying to find where there might be additional cases when in fact we know where an extreme number of deaths proportionally have occurred. So it seems to me once again, what we know is systemic racism and its tentacles are not, are not being overlooked so that we're not looking at where black and brown people have mm -hmm. died in exorbitant numbers and saying, listen, council member Bam, and this is in your district, do you have any plans? Have you made any efforts? What can we do to assist you or Councilman Barron? This is where we are putting up a, a, a mobile unit. And these are the groups in your community that you can expect to bring services. I haven't been reached and contacted in that, report, in that regard. I do yeah. want to say that land use did reach out to me with data about what was going on in this zip code and land use is now going to set up a meeting with the manager of Starbuck City to see what particularly, uh, what particularly effective measures we can put in place now. But I don't hear that from you. So rest yeah. of my time, I'd like to hear that. So, Council Member Barron, I'll take your yes. words right there. We are coming in Oct on October 7th with a new site for your community. And my ask of you, my long-winded ask, forgive me, I sometimes get long-winded, was going to be, can you work with us to identify uh, and that what we would need from you is, again, I think what we did in Soundview and Sunset Park was we brought the testing, but then we worked with the community. And I think that was the way to do it. We're going to bring the testing to you. And if you work with us, I'm confident we can have the same result we did in Sunset Park and Soundview. Thank you. And I have a, a couple of seconds less left. When you talk about testing, do you recommend that people have multiple tests spaced over a period of time or just one test done whenever and move on? Ah, good question. So it depends a little bit on the risk factors you have. So um, if you're a person that uh, has a job that in, uh, involves uh, multiple interactions with other people, of course, you should always wear a mask and socially distance, but it's reasonable to get yourself checked, say, every month. If you're in a position where um, you're only at home, you never leave home, you have less of a reason to get yourself tested at that frequency per se. What we do then is, uh, if depending on the type of job you have, I can time expired. Um, healthcare workers, we test every month in our system. Um, and we have other criteria that we um, use as well for other types of workers, but I think our time's expired. But follow up with me offline. I'm happy to share more. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the chairs. And uh, I look forward to your call or your email. Uh, today would be fine. Thank you. you got it. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. I see that we're joined again by council member Eugene. Um, would you like to pick up your line of questions? Yes, yes, thank you so much. I'm sorry about that. We had a, a technical uh, difficulties. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, the testing, the testing. We know that uh, COVID-19 is a very complex uh, situation. Before we believe that it was only respiratory, mentally respiratory disease, but this is not the case right now. It could be in any uh, uh, system in the in the body, but when somebody is tested is tested negative, is there any other follow up procedure to ensure that we have the, the the good result? Because we all know that in any test, there is false positive, false negative. What do you have in place to ensure that the person who is tested positive or negative, or especially negative? so we can ensure that the result is correct? Yes, that's a great question. Actually, Council Member Barron, who I think may have stepped away, started to answer it for you. So I will build off of what she said. Um, for negative test results, ne a negative result today does not mean that two days from now, you won't have symptoms and potentially be contagious. So negative results give you a point in time, but it is important that if you have one negative result, it doesn't mean that you're um, going to not have COVID for the rest of time. We do think that it is important that you get tested on certain frequencies. For example, in our system of health and hospitals, more than 40,000 people, 
our recommendation is for our employees to get tested once a month. Um, that is because if you're negative this day this month, it's not to say that you're going to be negative this day next month. So it's important to have a reasonable frequency. We don't believe that there's a whole lot of false positives, meaning a positive that actually is not positive. What we do see though, is a positive result doesn't necessarily mean you're contagious. If I tested you today and you were positive, I tested you again in three weeks, you have no symptoms, you're positive again, you probably have residual virus in your nose. It doesn't mean that you're still contagious though. Um, so that's how we break down the false positive and false negative uh, sort of, um, if you will, uh, yeah, situation. Uh, thank you for your answer. But what I'm uh, talking about, I'm not talking about somebody who's tested negative or is truly negative or truly uh, positive. I'm talking about false result because of manipulation, because of any type of a reason, because we know there is not 100% test in the world. That doesn't exist. There's always some percentage of mistake of error. It could be human error. It could be uh, a manufacturer error. It could be anything. And then the person may be tested positive or negative, but it, this is not the correct uh, uh, result. Let's say, for example, especially negative. I'm worried about, I'm concerned about those people who are falsely uh, negative because we know this is a very contagious disease. Let's say we tested somebody, the person is, te is tested negative, and we say, oh, that's okay, it's negative. But that person has the possibility to infect many other people. So my question is, after one test, if the person is tested negative, when you say one month, one month is a long time. A lot of things can happen, you know, a lot of contamination can, can, can occur. So is there any protocol when you test somebody, and especially if that person has other symptoms, other clinical manifestation? Because before we did, we did believe that COVID was the cause of a respiratory disease. That was the, the, the belief before. Mm -hmm. But right now it could be anywhere. The person can have can come with a diarrhea, with, come with, with any other symptom, and then, then the person may have the COVID, may have the virus, but because the test say that, oh, this person is negative. So what do we have in place to minimize the mistake and to ensure that the result that we have is accurate? Right. I and again, I, I got to mention also that we cannot, we cannot have 100% accuracy in anything. Yeah. So I'm talking about what do we have to minimize the mistake or to, in, to increase or improve the accuracy of the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I understand your question. So no test in medicine, as you know, doctor, is 100%. So if you're a contact and you're symptomatic, we treat you as a case, even if you have a negative result, because the degree of your exposure is too much. Um, and no test is 100%. So we treat you as a positive in that case, regardless of a negative result. If you have a positive result, then we know you 100% have it. I'm going to turn to Dr. Wallach to share more, but I understand your question. We do look at the, the extent of exposure and risk as uh, helping us to judge the result itself. Andrew? Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the question, uh, because you're absolutely right. As Dr. Long said, no test is 100% accurate. Um, however, uh, our testing overall for COVID-19 is pretty good. I think the issue is, is when we talk about our rapid testing, uh, if you get a negative test result on a rapid test, that's considered a preliminary negative. And we actually do confirm that negative test result with the test that goes to our reference lab. So in that case scenario, you are correct. It is a preliminary negative uh, that we confirm. Now, regardless of all that, um, um, we still recommend that everybody has universal masking, that people continue to social distance, and that people continue to use good hand hygiene. Because as Dr. Long pointed out, even though you may test negative, and it is a true negative today, you can still develop uh, COVID several days later. So that is why the importance of universal masking and social distancing is so important uh, throughout the pandemic here in New York City to prevent further spread. And the other point, just to reemphasize that Dr. Long had mentioned, that even if you test negative 
and you have signs of symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, you are treated as if you have COVID-19 for the reasons that you mentioned, that no test is 100% perfect. And we have to treat the individual and their clinical signs and symptoms at that time. Thank you very much, Doc. But my last question is that since you have been doing tracing and, and testing and tracing for a long time, do you have in record a number of false positive or negative? Did you observe, observe any situation or any false positive or negative? And do you have in record? Yes, yeah, so we'll, I'll start now, turn to Dr. Wallach. Um, it's important to say, and that's in, to answer your question, that we, the test characteristics go to the FDA for any given test. So what we do is we look at those test characteristics and then we also make sure that, that uh, we monitor in our system as we're using the test as well, um, because every test has to be validated before we use it. So Andrew, do you want to share more about um, so our sort of process for looking at tests? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Dr. Law. So that's exactly right. So um, any test that we use um, in New York City is first approved by the FDA through the Emergency Use Author Authorization Act. Uh, to make sure it is a valid test. On top of that, New York City Health and Hospitals also then does a separate validation study uh, of those tests uh, before we employ them on large scale uh, with our patient population. Um, so I don't have an exact number, uh, Councilman, to give you as far as the actual number of false negatives and positives, although I can tell you it's definitely on the low end. Um, and to that point, again, uh, as part of our clinical guidance for any patient who we test, we emphasize very strongly uh, that should they develop signs or symptoms, uh, we would ask that they uh, isolate at home um, and uh, return for a repeat testing. Uh, thank you very much, doctors, and thank you all to my chairs. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Eugene. I'm now going to turn it over to Councilmember Amphrey Samuel for her questions. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I had the same line of questions as council member Inez Barron. And so I just want to um, publicly co-sign on all of her questions. Um, um, in particular, I wanted to kind of dive into like lessons learned from the spring and the summer, um, knowing that, you know, what we are hearing is predicted for the fall and, and winter. And so I just wanted to, you know, just kind of get a sense of um, what did you for now so but she's she covered that um so i just wanted to kind of get some clarity on the website and that's um because you know a lot of people uh do not open that particular website and this is also um you know for the public as well so there was mention about the zip codes of the contact tracers yeah and um just as an example mm -hmm. um when i pull up one one two one two there are 54 monitors and tracers listed under that zip code. So can you give me a sense of what does that mean? Because when you go to the definitions, the reporting definitions under monitors and tracers, it says counts of case contact monitors and case investigators, community engagement specialists hired or contracted and the languages they speak. So can you kind of just give me a sense of what does that mean the number 54 next to the zip code 11212, and what do they actually do? And also with that same um, line of questioning, on the same data sheet, it speaks to 1,273 languages spoken by the tracers, and that's amazing. Um, but in my district, we do speak different languages, but in that zip code 11212, the language that is spoken is Brownsville speak, like literally. And so that's a, 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 a local dialect, right? And it may sound like English, but when you have a conversation with someone in my district, you may not be able to communicate with them because it's a different type of communication. And that's real. 
And I've said this before, I remember having this conversation around, you know, how people, uh, well, the lack of trust that people have for government, the lack of trust that people have for elected officials, period, um, 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 healthcare professionals, we don't go to the hospital, we don't have primary care physicians. And so if somebody who speaks, you know, anything on this list, somebody who, you know, clearly is, you know, have an ethnic background, call someone and ask about their, you know, activities, you may not get a positive response. And so can you speak a little to, again, that number of contact tracers in certain zip codes and how do you um, make sure that the people that are working in certain communities should be there? And um, just as an example, when I walk around the community, even during census 2020, and there are enumerators out there, they may speak different languages, but when they knock on that door and try to you know, communicate with someone in my district, it doesn't work because they can't encourage them or influence them to, you know, like, to respond. So can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, so the first part of your question was around uh, 11212, um, the number 54. So to be uh, concrete on that, those are the, that's the number of our overall contact tracers um, that live in that, in that zip code. Um, so now it actually gets to your second point, which is um, it's one thing to define languages, but it's another to understand how to engage people in a community, even if it's under the same umbrella of the same language. Um, and you know, that's why we, we were so intentional about making sure that we hired contact tracers from all of our, especially our hardest hit communities, because you know, that number right there just shows the number of people that we have on our team that are from your community. And I would hope they would under, understand your community better than anybody else would. Um, but if there are other people, other community groups, and the, the contact tracers being from the community is one way that we seek, we want to engage with you and your community, but also working with CBOs. So if there are any CBOs that we could or should work with, would welcome con uh, continuing that conversation as well. Okay, just a couple of more seconds, um, Chair, because I see my time is about to run out. Um, um, expired. So I traveled and I had to quarantine when I returned. Mm -hmm. And um, I had someone call me. And the person that called me was reading from a script. I was annoyed by the questions I was annoyed by. And, and I'm a very helpful person. Like in the end, I continued, I, like I, I explained to her, like, um, you know, thank you for doing this. You know, you may want to do X, Y, Z. It, it was a, it, it was not a pleasant call. And I'm, I'm me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can only imagine the difficulty she's had with other people. And so I'm very concerned about, and, and you know, this is my zip code, right? And so I would hope that somebody that would have called me was from my community, right? Because that's what you're telling me, right? But well, like I personally experienced leaving, having, you know, a contact tracer contact me and be in contact with me for damn near every freaking single day. I'm like, <laughs> you don't have to call me anymore. You don't call me, please. Um, but it, it was a person that was not from my community. Yeah. And it was a struggle. You're, you're correct in that. So the person, if you were, God forbid, diagnosed with coronavirus, the person knocking on your door would be the person we'd want to be from your community. For travelers, what, what you're referring to is we're actually just calling travelers to let them know about what the quarantine is and let them know about resources we can offer. So that's, um, that's uh, different than trying to build trust through the contact tracing program. The, the call you got was more education information and offering resources. But if, so if you do, and I hope you don't, um, uh, or if you have a loved one that gets diagnosed with coronavirus, that's where we think it's especially important because that's where we're asking you for contact. But I, I, I would, I'm sorry, let me just, yeah. I would question that because if I traveled, I came back, I did not take a COVID test, right? And I could have been, um, uh, you know, visiting with other people. I could have been outside. I could have put others in danger and there would be a need for the contact tracer to be able to communicate with me to find out what, you know, what was, what were my activities when I returned. So it shouldn't just be like a quick call. Like I would, I would want the same person that's calling to be just as invested in making sure that, um, you know, like 
I'm not just, am I being safe, but and responsible, but you know, the other people who I have connected with or contact, been in contact with. So yeah. I just wanted to that's, say that. That's helpful feedback. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, if you do get tested and your test result comes back, that puts you into the, the group of people where we, um, where we, we've gotten it right in terms of having people from our communities be the ones calling. But I think your point's well taken. We'll take that back. I appreciate your feedback. It's good to, I appreciate your experience. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I have other questions, but I'll submit them. <laughs> All right, and I, I just want to add uh, to uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel's point is that if you can just commit to getting machine readable format and fully disaggregated data made available to all of us so we can read it and we can assist our communities, clearly we all want to be involved. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I have been very proactive in getting testing sites and as soon as we get them, I I'm very excited about them. You kind of just, you know, pop up in the location that we worked on together, but I don't really get notice. So it's even little things like that. Anyway, I, I wanna make sure that we move on to the to the next council member who, who has a question. Uh, is council member Reynoso with us? Yeah, yeah, I'll find information to trust in our cards. All right. Time starts now. Uh, finally, yeah. You're on mute, Antonio. Council member Reynoso. Because of where we are. Um, it seems like we may be having some technical difficulties with council member Reynoso. Um, were there any other council members who have questions who have not yet asked them? If you do, please use the raise hand function. Um, I see that council member Ayala has now raised her hand. Um, Time starts now. Thank you, thank you. Goodness sakes, it takes forever to just get your hand up. Um, but my question is, I, I mean, I'm familiar, and 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 my office is actually open. It's been open for some time, and we've been, you know, documenting uh, information on individuals that come in contact with the office, so that we have them in the event that somebody gets ill, and we can kind of practice, right, um, what what you're discussing today. However. I'm a little bit um, not disappointed, but just I haven't heard anything from the from the city. And I think that um, I, I'm very active in my community and I know a lot of my colleagues are. We're out there doing book bag giveaways, food distribution drives. Um, I mean, you name it, we're doing it. And so we, we come in contact with a, a large percentage of our constituency and it would be nice to have access to some of this data in real time. I mean, I haven't heard from anyone um, in the administration about contact tracing happening in my district. And I have uh, parts of my district zip codes that had the highest numbers um, in the entire city, Highbridge in the South Bronx, uh, zip code 10029 here in East Harlem with the hardest hits. And I, I really haven't heard from anyone. No one has requested a meeting or called me or said, listen, this is how, you know, this is what we're doing in your district. This is how you can be helpful and partner with us. Um, and I think that, that is, that's important. That's an important part of the conversation because we are your community validators, right? Mm -hmm. We are the people that, you know, um, the community trusts to come to them with valuable um, and reliable information. So I'm not sure why um, it is purposeful or what, why um, that, that is, that there is no communication between your offices and um, the elected uh, officials. Yeah, well, actually, uh I'd love to take you up on your offer there. So um, uh, you have, you know your community better than anybody does, and I have an ask of you. Um, what we need to do, especially now to keep New York City safe, is we need to do as much testing as we can. But even if, and this was to an earlier point, I think this was Council Member Levine, 
we've done a good job of building up a lot of capacity, but now we want to bring everybody in to use the capacity that we've built. Now we're targeting it where we know it's needed most, but we have capacity across the board in every community. So what I'd love to do is to have um, Annabelle Palma on the phone now. Can we connect our offices together and talk about how to get the word out and how we can help and maybe you can help get the word out about bringing people in to get tested and we'll do the testing? Absolutely, I will. <laughs> this this new thing. Um, thank you, Dr. Long. I absolutely will follow up with Councilmember Ayala and get this um, ball rolling in terms of um, you know partnering with her and going out to her community and, and bringing the resources that we need um, there. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. Um, we are. Joined again by Councilmember Reynoso. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. I was uh, off on a call for a couple of seconds there. Um, uh, I have two two concerns that I want to address. The first one is if we have less than five Yiddish speakers, and the most recent increase in uh, COVID testing or positive cases come in large Yiddish communities. How is it that, let's say five, I'm gonna just say five of them, best case scenario, five Yiddish speaking contact tracers were able to connect with 90, what you would call a 90% contact rate when we have uh, hundreds, hundreds of positive testing or positive, positive cases in, let's say just South Brooklyn alone in my part of the district, south, south of Broadway um, in Williamsburg. How the, the math there doesn't add up unless those five contact tracers are talking, are, are calling people like every five minutes, they're meeting someone new. And I, sorry, that's my son in the background. That's okay. Uh, and so I can't under, so I don't understand how the math works there. Um, and then I'm going to ask the second one, which is sure. uh, black and brown communities that are adjacent to uh, the, or, or zip codes that are adjacent to zip codes that are currently uh have many positive cases, um, like uh, my district is 11211. So uh, south of Broadway and north of Broadway, um, there's a lot of cases south of Broadway, there's less cases north of Broadway, but now the north of Broadway is starting to get, is gonna, is starting to have cases as well. So the uptick is happening there. The death rate is twice as much in black and brown communities. I really need to understand on 11211 what is happening uh, to ensure that the, 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 the positive cases don't continue to trend upward in the Latino part of the community, mm -hmm. um, which has a higher death rate um, uh, if exposed to coronavirus. So I just wanted to understand those two things. Mostly. Yeah, those are two great questions. I'll answer both of them specifically. First one, um, this sh <laughs> sorry, your son in the background. <laughs> um, so, so to answer, my, my son's 18 months old, I, I understand. Um, to answer your first question, honestly, we can't do this alone. Um, in the communities where we're seeing an uptick now, um, we, with our tracers and our team, we need to work with the communities if we're going to succeed. That's how we've succeeded as a city. We need to work with community-based organizations. We need to work with local leaders. And that's what, we're, what we are doing now. We're working with as many community-based organizations, all of which speak Yiddish, uh, that we possibly can. And when we have 300 plus people handing out masks, when we have uh, we've gone to 300 synagogues to hand out ma uh, masks too. We don't just hand them out, not telling anybody we're there. We work with the community uh, to talk about why this is important and to talk to community leaders why this is important too. And like with, with you and with other community leaders, we need to work together with, if we're going to succeed here, in particular with communities um, like the ones where we're seeing an uptick now. So you get to your second question and I'll go back to you. Um, what do we do about other communities that are bordering on where we've started to see the upticks? Very good question. The answer is simple. We need to do testing. We need to work with you to do as much testing as humanly possible. And you tell me where you need us, we will be there. Once we do that, we'll not only have a better sense of what's going on in your community, but even more important than that, we'll know how we need to intervene. We'll know who the cases are. We can intervene now immediately. So if we work together, we can do it. Thank you, sorry, I was, I was muted. Uh, I, I hear you about working together, but uh, 
Broadway is the border of my district, right? So my relationships are north of Broadway, not south of Broadway. So I don't know who you should be talking to south of Broadway, but I know that if you don't do the work south of Broadway, that it's going to affect north of Broadway. So because um, council districts tend to be like small little cities within themselves, um, I, I get I get myself in a position where I can't help my people because of the lack of relationships I have with another district. So um, I, I need to make... And look, you could walk down south of Broadway and more than 60, 70% of the people there are not wearing masks. It's like very clear. Um, so, uh, you know, th there has to be a responsibility by government, not by me as an elected representative, but by um, health and hospitals and by DOHMH to do this work to make sure that that doesn't happen specifically because my district um, it has a higher op uh, opportunity to, 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 to has higher death rates than the community that's south of us. So I just yeah. need you to be very, uh, understand that dynamic um, uh, because it's, it's, it's important. And still, you're saying a lot of community. So what you're saying is if you have a community organization is doing the contact tracing for you or making the calls for you, um, it's a volume thing. I don't understand how you can get through the volume if you only have five Yiddish speakers. Yeah, and then we're working with- Time expired. If I can just answer, I think it's an important question. South of Broadway, to your point, is where we're working with TBOs, community organizations, and community leaders to get the word out, which starts with testing. We can't do any contact tracing if you don't get tested. And then on the contact tracing part, um, right now, we actually, our numbers in terms of um, people that we do contact tracing with, um, we actually are seeing a similar proportion of new cases in the communities that we're talking about here that are isolating meaning not leaving their homes when we diagnose them with coronavirus as compared to the rest of the city. The challenge we're having is getting people to come out and get tested and then having them pick up the phone when we call. But I just totally agree with you. That's where, that's where we need help from community leaders and community-based organizations. Once we get you on the phone, we know what we're doing, but we need help in getting the word out. For you, north of Broadway, it starts with testing. So I'm not asking you to okay. fix the south of Broadway problem. What I am asking you is tell us where we need to be north of Broadway and we'll be there. All right, so I will be doing that and um, not be talking to uh, Commissioner Jackie Bray, I guess, who's been helping us out. I know she was on a call with us. I just want to say, just acknowledge that once uh, we saw the upticks, uh, uh, the commissioner reached out to us right away. We, we were supposed to be on a conference call. I didn't make it, but other folks did. Um, so I'll be following up with her again to, to see what we can do. But I really appreciate um, everyone here. Very, uh, thank Jackie you. Bray is very good. Thank yes. you. All right, take care. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. We're not, we'll now turn it back over to Chair Rivera, who has additional questions. A couple more questions. I, I wanted to ask uh, for a full list of all community-based organizations and community leaders working with the T2 program. Mm -hmm. If you could send that over to us, I would greatly appreciate it. And speaking of your coordination, you know, with community-based organizations, with community leaders, hopefully with more elected officials who really want to be engaged in this process, how have you coordinated with state agencies on contact tracing? State agencies, federal agencies, I guess, making sure that we're all working together. And are you sharing contact tracing information with the state's contact tracing program, ComCare? Good question. I'll start and then I'm going to turn to uh, Jackie Bray, who we were just talking about. Um, so just as way of background here, anybody that gets a test in New York City, whether it's City MD or whether it's at my clinic in Morrisania in the Bronx and health and hospitals, um, all positive test results go to the state, the State Department of Health, because it's a reportable disease. Same as many others. It's not unique in that way. Then the positive, their results come to our local Department of Health, and that's where the data stays under strong protection, as with any reportable disease. Um, what's unique about coronavirus is, to your point, the extent to which we need to work together with the states to have alignment um, uh, in terms of our respective approaches. So with that, I'll turn to Jackie to talk about our coordination with the state. Um, hi. Yeah, so we, anytime that we see a case or a contact that we find that lives out of jurisdiction, whether that's Nassau County or Westchester or New Jersey or Florida. Um, our team, the team that Neil Vora leads uh, has an out of jurisdiction team and they're sending that information via a system called EPIAX uh, to that jurisdiction. We're also receiving out of jurisdiction information um, 
from everyone as well and entering that into our system. Um, the state uses ComCare in a similar way that we use Salesforce. So other counties, instead of their tr contact tracers using Salesforce as their sort of customer relations uh, management software, they're using ComCare. Salesforce and ComCare are not, um, they're not like talking to each other every day, but we are absolutely passing the information about cases and contacts back and forth between jurisdictions. State, New York state counties um, and also uh, other, other states. Neil, anything else on that one? Yeah, I, I think you, you got it correctly. And, and also on the part about the federal collaboration, yeah. um, we, we're not sharing information with uh, federal government except when someone has traveled on an airplane um, and the federal government would then notify us that there was a person who was on a plane who might have exposed uh, some New York City residents and then we can follow up with those New York City residents. And so in that way we are collaborating um, with the CDC. Okay, how are you, how is h, &H utilizing uh, the Department of Health's expertise to implement the T2 program? I know the uh, Department of Health, there's some time constraints so I wanted to make sure that we got a chance to ask you, how is the Department of Health directly involved in the program? What, are, what role are you playing in regards to community engagement and education? This is yeah. like your wheelhouse. So how, how are you all working together? And I'd love to hear from, from the commissioner as well. You should yeah. hear from Dimitri. Well, me, I'll start and then um, uh, I'll pass to Dimitri. I want to note as I start that um, uh, Dr. Vora is actually from the Department of Health as well. Um, so half the people on our team uh, the, on the screen here that I see are from DOHMH and um, half are from Health and Hospitals. And that actually is a pretty good description of how we've done everything the whole way through. Everything we've done in terms of program design and implementation has been in lockstep together. Uh, we do contact tracing for all cases. The Department of Health um, does cluster evaluations, investigations, uses our data to inform where we should focus our efforts. Even on the community engagement side, um, we have staff that, um, uh, that work together to go, for example, evaluate schools, to even to pass out masks, work with community-based organizations, which is how we're passing out 300,000 masks right now um, in the affected areas. Um, so, Dimitri, can I turn to you to share more about um, uh, our, uh, how we work together? Certainly. Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Rivera. So I think um, we, um, I, I sort of used the assembly line uh, uh, analogy before, and it really, it really is that. So I think that um, different strengths for different parts of this program, which I think taken broadly is T2, including the DOHMH part of T2, um, where we really are capitalizing on the fact that T2 is able to do really high volume calling and really get to people uh, in a way to get the information that we need. And then using the expertise at the Department of Health with uh, more sensitive, often more complex investigations, specifically around clusters, um, really allows us to have an iterative process where we identify individuals who are in those facilities, um, who are potentially contacts, we then ship through that same assembly line, the contacts back to T2, and because of the way that they're staffed, they're able to do all the follow-up. So I think we have a really great flow of data and information. Additionally, um, we are, when asked how often do we meet, it's really hard to say because we are in one constant 24-hour meeting um, that we, uh, in terms of our communication. So I think that as we hear about clusters, as we hear about um, it's really anything that we need to talk about. We have really direct lines and our division of labor um, is not siloed, but rather again on this uh, on this continuous spectrum of, of, uh, of experience. So I think, you know, um, really just like the rest of this response that pulls from many, many agencies uh, into sort of this one big citywide response, this is a great example, I think, of, uh, of how to integrate uh, different talent pools and different staffing models to create a, a better delivery system of an important educational and public health program. Thank you for that. I just wanted to ask one more question about the testing. Can you tell us how soon communities are, are getting results? I ask, uh, I guess more specifically, does turnaround times do turnaround times differ per community? And I just wanna, and then I'm gonna ask you about rapid test after that. Mm -hmm. I'll start and then I'm gonna go back to um, Dr. Daskalakis to share more here. 
So um, with turnaround times, the median for New York City now, I believe, is two days. Um, and that cuts across all of New York City. Um, and then it, within our health and hospital sites, we do have an ability through um, both how we've set up our lab arrangements, but also how we, are able, how we prioritize based on where we're seeing upticks to do even better than that. So um, at many of our, and we also have our new uh, New York City Public Health Lab, uh, uh, where um, we're able to run tests within 24 hours. So we have a lot of abilities, a lot of ability to, in communities where there is need, actually turn around testing as fast or faster than, than pretty much anybody else uh, across the country. Um, Dimitri, do you wanna share more about the distribution across of uh, different areas of New York City or anything else you wanna add? Um, no, I think I think you've got it. And uh, just confirming that the citywide turnaround time is two days. I also want to note that, as you remember, uh, sort of as as testing was scaling up, um, you know, the, there were sort of extremes. Like some people were waiting for 14, so those extremes have really dropped too. So I think you know, even even the top 25 percentile of people getting test results are getting them really fairly tightly around two days. So really, uh, the the various things, including the launch of the of the, uh, 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 the pandemic response or PRL lab um, has really been helpful in, uh, in doing this. So, uh, and also again, uh, the COVID express site at our sexual health clinics uh, and uh, at Department of Health, um, really with, with fast turnaround times, um, I think overall city is going in a great direction. And again, it looks like we have more capacity. So it's, it's all great news from the turnaround time perspective. Yep. Thank you so much. I think one of the, the concerns I received from the community advisory board was just making sure that, you know, certain communities didn't get the turnaround time quicker than others, as was noted in kind of the historic disparities throughout the process. And I just want to know, when is rapid testing going to, when do you see it being available to the city? Are, are there current efforts to ensure that those who need the test get priority on the basis of, of risk factors as opposed to anyone who wants a test? And I guess that goes for PCR and rapid tests. Yeah, that's a great question. So right now we have tens of rapid testing machines and um, they're, mo they're mobile. So what we're doing now is uh, moving all of them into where we need them the most, which are the communities where we're seeing the uh, uptick right now. Um, and that's been part of our hyperlocal response the whole way through is we brought in rapid testing machines because we know that's where we need to really bolster testing in those communities like Sunset Park or Soundview or Ozone Park. Um, right now, we're focusing our rapid testing machines in on, um, again, these zip codes uh, that have more than 3% of people testing positive, and they actually are going live, um, tens of them today. Um, so and we're going to bring in, as, uh, we're bringing in all of our troops to focus in on these communities. Um, so more to come there, but today is the day to go live. Okay, thank you for that. I just think, you know, transparency is just so key. And so I know I've asked you a little bit about data, data privacy, but um, it, it is a, a very, very big concern. I know you have some things on your website posted that says we're committed to protecting your health information and maintaining confidentiality and privacy. But on the what is tracing subpage, it says, will my contract tracer share my information with law enforcement or immigration services? Any information you share with your contact tracer will not be shared with immigration, law enforcement, or justice officials unless required by law. And so, again, just to the data point as to this information, keeping it secure, and your coordination with agencies to make sure that we're protecting um, that very, very sensitive information. So I just want to turn it over to, to Chair Levine and, and make sure that he gets, you know, last crack before before we let you all go. And, and thank you so much for your time thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rivera. And I'll forego questions because uh, we we have members of the public who want to testify, and we of course want to let uh, the administration get back to work during this time of crisis. I, I do just want to make the point that you're hearing a lot of urgency from from us, from our colleagues right now, because we understand that there's a distinct possibility that the second wave is coming. In fact, it may already be starting. And, you know, we've had, thankfully, three plus months where the spread of the virus here has been fairly limited. And so that's given us a chance to build out these systems for testing and tracing. But now those systems are about to be under much greater stress. 
as the number of cases rises uh, and as contact tracing becomes much more complicated because, excuse me, I'm just gonna pause and ask my wonderful family to, to quiet for one. Here. Working at home, folks. At least they would. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're anticipating a more challenging stage ahead, and uh, it's why we're putting these tough questions on the table. And we're pretty certain that uh, what lies ahead will, again, disproportionately impact uh, marginalized communities in this city. And so we have to redouble our efforts to reach out to them, to have uh, speak in the languages that they speak, to build trust in those communities, uh, that's really the only way we can tackle the inequality th of this pandemic. And so we just wanna urge you to continue to push on, on that front uh, so, so that we do reach the people we need to uh, in the challenging months ahead. Um, that's it for me. Uh, thanks again to the administration. Thank you. Great, seeing no more questions from council members, we will now conclude the first panel and move on to the public testimony. Thank you again, members of the administration. So the public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions can use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on after the panel has completed its testimony in the order with which you're, you have raised your hand. The first public panel in order of speaking will be Miao, Dr. Miao Jenny Hua, Ali Baum, and um, Holly Yi. Um, Dr. Dr. Hua, you may begin. Time starts now. Hi, good morning, um, or rather good afternoon. Thank you, Chairpersons Rivera and Levine for holding this hearing. Um, it couldn't be more timely. Uh, my name is Miao Jenny Hua. Um, I'm here representing the New York Doctors Coalition, which is a collection of physicians and healthcare advocacy groups located um, in or with local chapters in the New York area, bring together over 20 member groups uh, with over 20,000 doctors and trainees. Um, my talk will be in three sections, um, touching on uh, persistent equities and contact tracing on uh, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's initial role um, in pandemic pr prevention and current um, preparedness. Um, as well as uh, inequality in isolation options and treatment access, um, which I, you know, potentially more relevant for future hearings, but I think it's important to bring these issues up front. Um, so to begin, uh, in March, our group proposed in City Limits the concept of pandemic hot zones based on the regional disparity in case rates and death rates at the time. Um, so New York City, as we've discussed, um, zip codes with transmission rates near or above 3% des uh, deserve priority for SARS-CoV-2 PCR or rapid testing and contact tracing resources. Um, this is because the 3% level has been proposed um, by uh, various institutions, including Harvard Global Health Institute, as a positivity rate consistent with appropriate access to testing. Um, however, until there is widespread vaccination, former hot zones are also more likely to experience disproportionate suffering and death um, uh, just due to the social determinants of health um, that led to this disparity um, and remain risk factors for harm from COVID-19. Um, thus, hot zones uh, in, uh, described by the March uh, definition uh, are zip codes with death rates of 500 or higher per 100,000 population. Um, uh, or with case rates of 3,500 or higher per 100,000. Um, so these include uh, East New York, uh, Canarsie Flatlands, um, Rockaway and Coney Island in Brooklyn, um, Northeast Bronx, Pelham, Morrisania, um, Kingsbridge and Fordham in the Bronx, uh, and West Queens, Elmhurst, Flushing and Jackson Heights um, in Queens. Um, and so these districts continue to require intensive test, trace and take care resources to mitigate the health inequities highlighted during the first uh, surge. Therefore, we recommend focusing on T2 or T3 uh, resources on the original hot zone zip codes in addition to those with a uh, test positivity rate currently at or above 3%. Uh, we maintain that uh, areas hit hardest in March and April 
uh, remain at highest risk um, due to chronic uh, uh, disadvantage, racism, and uh, chronic underinvestment. Um, so next, uh, let me turn to discuss the uh, uh, New York City DOHMH's role in the past and current pandemic response. So in March, um, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was involved. Time expired. Okay. Uh, in setting up alternate care sites. Um, so these had been underutilized. Um, and currently, uh, let me just summarize very quickly since my time has expired. Um, currently, what we have repeatedly heard is that uh, uh, after Health and Hospital took over contact tracing, they uh, lacked statutory authority to collect information on health, uh, public health information, um, since only the DOHMH has a statutory authority to collect this data, a memorandum of understanding facility the transfer of jurisdiction, including over 100 staff members. However, um, H and uh, Health and Hospitals is still running into problems uh, related to the lack of jurisdic uh, jurisdiction, including delays in the time of collection of COVID-19 surveillance data from hospitals and um, uh, private practitioners around the city. Um, so it uh, deserves, I think, asking uh, why uh, DOHMH was not um, uh, maintained as a director uh, in a directing position in this contact tracing process with um, health and hospitals um, to assist because of its uh, greater um, hiring capacity and manpower, um, instead exposing it to um, potential conflict of interest through hiring of Optum. Um, and lastly, I do want to bring our attention to the inequality in isolation options and treatment access around the city, uh, as we know, um, now that outcomes across city hospitals were highly unequal during the initial surge. Um, according to data from uh, April, only around 26% of COVID-19 patients were hospitalized. Um, uh, and many of the um, elderly and frail and um, people of color among the um, outer boroughs um, did not um, obtain equal access to treatment and uh, timely admission compared to those in Manhattan. Um, also, we know that uh, these alternate care sites, including USNS Comfort and Javits Center, were underutilized, um, and, and in particular, egress from overwhelmed hospitals in the outer boroughs was impeded um, to these alternate care sites because of a hyper-selective 49-item criteria that initially uh, excluded patients with COVID-19. Um, so uh, there's also another huge problem with ho hospitalizing only 26% of patients in the midst of a pandemic, not limited to the individual lives at stake. It basically assumes from the outset that hospitals do not have a role to play in interrupting the virus's chain of um, transmission. Um, and you know, because a co negative test result was not necessary for discharge in New York, many patients returned to the um, communities to endan endanger others and their uh, loved ones around them. Um, so these are mistakes that I think we can learn from as we approach a probable and imminent second surge. First, with a clear sense of the biological and social determinants of uh, morbidity and mortality, um, screening criteria for recommending admission and follow-up can be more targeted at those who can benefit the most, while the specific terms of admission criteria, I think, uh, require thorough review of the literatures. Um, it should ultimately result in lowering the threshold for admitting patients in comparison to the relatively high threshold in March and April, uh, taking into account particularly racism as a risk factor. Um, second, existing hospital facilities, especially chronically underfunded, understaffed safety net hospitals require disproportionately more support. Um, uh, the needs of existing acute care facilities, including overflow areas, should take priority over alternate care sites, which if they are to be utilized, may be better suited as sites for isolation under monitoring or uh, for asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic uh, cases. It stands to reason that a moratorium on the closure of existing inpatient acute care facilities, such, such as Kingsburg Jewish uh, Medical Center and East um, Flatbush would be imperative. Um, thank you, my time has ran out. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure we can get to all our panelists. We can make sure you can hear us and we appreciate it. I think we were very clear in back in May how disappointed we were at the change with Department of Health and Health and Hospitals. So thank you. Just want to make sure everyone can see the clock and, and can hear us for when we prompt you to wrap up. I appreciate everyone for, for waiting this long. I really, really do. Next, next panelist. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. So we're now going to move on to Ali Bond. I'm starts now. On behalf of the NYCLU, thank you for holding this hearing. We all share the fervent desire to safely reopen our city, and there is broad consensus that contact tracing is essential to doing so. 
Unfortunately, a necessary ingredient for effective contact tracing, community trust, is still missing. According to the data h and released yesterday, only 48% of cases share their contacts with contact tracers. Although this is a slight improvement from the summer, it is still woefully inadequate. And thanks to a toxic cocktail of socioeconomic factors, physical environment, and inferior access to healthcare, black and brown communities are disproportionately likely to suffer from COVID-19. These, these communities are also disproportionately likely to be alienated from our healthcare system as a result of the racial biases that pervade that system. And they also bear the brunt of over-policing generally and specifically to enforce COVID-19 related social distancing. As our nation stands in the midst of a long overdue reckoning on racism and white supremacy, any distrust black and brown New Yorkers might have feels understandable. But New York City has the tools at its disposal to build the necessary trust in our contact tracing program if only we would use them. In July, h, &H put out a request for proposals for community-based organizations to deliver the city's COVID-19 messaging. It did not provide a mechanism for the community-based organizations to help define the government's plans to meet community identified needs. This is a missed opportunity. Just as community members have been more effective at convincing their neighbors to wear masks and adhere to social distancing, community members and organizations are more likely than outsiders to know how to convince their neighbors to identify their contacts, to get tested, to self quarantine when necessary. They are also more likely to be attuned to community specific needs around stigma and safety, whether regarding sensitive associations, immigration enforcement, or overcriminalization. H, H should use this opportunity to learn from the community-based organizations it solicits. Second, effective contact tracing requires individuals to share a constellation of intimate information with contact tracers, their location, their health status, and their associations. H, H cannot guarantee that contact tracing information will be shielded from law enforcement and immigration authorities. If individuals have any reason to believe that sharing the details of their lives will expose them or their loved ones to criminalization or deportation, they will not participate. Fortunately, there is a bill on the governor's desk right now, a 10,500C slash S8450C, that would ensure that law enforcement and immigration enforcement cannot serve as contact tracers or access contact tracing information, and that an individual's contact tracing information cannot be used against them. City council members should do everything in your power to urge Governor Cuomo to sign that bill immediately. Contact tracing is too important to get wrong. Ensuring that the T2 program is culturally and linguistically competent and that contact tracing information collected to stop a public health emergency is shielded from law enforcement and ICE are not just privacy and civil rights goals, they're public health imperatives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. We're now gonna to turn to Holly Yee. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Holly Yee, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Thank you, Chairman Levine and Rivera, and members of Committee on Health and on Hospitals for giving us this opportunity to testify. Um, CACF speaks on behalf of our 70 plus member and partner organizations and the highly immigrant APA communities they serve who have been left behind in the city's COVID response and must be centered in the discussion of revitalization as they face greater challenges and loss due to this pandemic. While the city has touted the advancements that have been made in testing capacity recently, there is still inadequate testing in low-income neighborhoods, which have been hit especially hard by the pandemic. We've heard from community members and organizations that severe shortages of testing resources remain in their neighborhoods, with results taking anywhere from two days to two weeks to be reported back to them. We've also heard unfortunate testimony from our communities that testing centers and resources have been pulled out or heavily reduced in some of the most hard-hit areas, such as Amherst and Corona both heavily APA community populations. Ensuring best practices around COVID-19 testing is key to New York City's recovery. It's critical in making it safe for our children to learn in person and for our community's revitalization efforts. Furthermore, for our city to continue phases of reopening, we have to think about more than 3% citywide average transmission rate threshold that the city is focused on currently. We are asking city council today to hold our public health systems accountable to our community's needs. First, we demand that the city provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data on infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths in the APA community. In order to best respond to this pandemic and reopen safely, we must at least be able to track race and ethnicity and languages spoken for those who are tested so we can appropriately chase and take care of families. We are not doing this adequately now and our communities and our struggles are being erased. Second, we demand that schools in partnership with the city's health system can ensure that critical information gets to the families and languages they need. 
It's only recently that H and H was able to translate health outreach documents in the city's top 11 languages required by local law. Yet this was too late and still not enough. We have to be prepared to reach and support students and families who are limited English proficient. And third, we demand that the city address the mental health needs of children and families, especially those who are East Asian presenting who have been targeted during this pandemic. There needs to be a system in place that can be prepared to help our communities who have faced loss, isolation, discrimination, xenophobia, and more as they return to daily life. Our communities are consistently overlooked in the distribution of resources, which is harmful to us, as well as other communities of colors who are denied the same resources due to the perceived success of our community. The pandemic has highlighted a myriad of holes in our city safety net systems, and the city's response must address root problems in addition to immediate needs. Our community will continue to suffer every day we allow these flaws in the system to exist. As always, CACF will continue to be available as a resource and partner to address these concerns, and we look forward to working with the city to better address the inequities that we see day in and day out within our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it over to chairs for um, questions for the first panel. Chair Levine, I'll turn it over to you. If you have any questions. Thank you. Um, this is an important panel. All three of you brought up so many critical points. Um, uh, Ali, j just a question for you. Do, you. do you have an assessment on the data processing system that we're using for contact tracing and the extent to which uh, you feel it meets adequate standards on privacy and data security? I wish I had a good answer to that, uh, Chairman. I think, unfortunately, like much of the program, many of their data systems have been shrouded in secrecy. So we don't have a ton of information, but I will touch base with our technologist and get back to you to see if we have any more specifics. We've also put forward some public records requests to the city trying to ascertain more information about their data practices. Thank you, yes, I, I know that you, you are fighting uh, to build confidence in the program so that people participate. And it is really critical that we push hard on these questions of privacy, uh, data security, um, and, and uh, a rock solid guarantee that none of the information will be shared with law enforcement or federal authorities. So we appreciate you fighting for that. Um, and we'd we'll love to follow up with you on, on some of the questions we're discussing here. Thank you. Thank you. I just I wanted to reiterate that we, we, we try to get at some of the, the privacy concerns and we'll certainly be advocating to, for that bill um, at the state level. Thanks to all of you for for all of your work and for bringing up the issues of Department of Health and H&H. &H, and I know we all want to work together to support our communities. Thank you to the panel. Yes, thank you to our first panel. I'm seeing no other questions. I'm going to move on to our second public panel. So in order of speaking, our second panel will be Farah Salam, Yunhai Grace Kim, and Lori Huan. Um, so Farah Salam, you may begin when ready. Time starts now. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank, uh, want to begin by thanking the Committee on Health, Committee on Hospitals, and the entire New York City Council for inviting us to comment on budget proposals for fiscal year 2021. My name is Farah Salam, and I'm the Community Health and Wellbeing Coordinator at the Arab American Family Support Center. I'm honored to testify today alongside the 15% and growing campaign on behalf of our communities throughout New York City. Our staff speaks 27 languages, including Arabic, Bangladesh, Russian, Spanish, and Urdu, which enables us to serve population that mainstream providers struggle to reach. As a result, our agency has remained open during COVID-19, offering uninterrupted service delivery throughout this crisis. We've adapted to social distancing and shelter in place regulations and have been involving our service provision to best meet the current crisis and the emerging needs of our client base. Our services are more essential than ever. So we've increased our outreach across programs and launched new initiatives to meet these heightened needs for mental health services and access to health insurance, food safety, amongst other programs. 
However, COVID-19 has created additional barriers for our organization and the community members we serve. While this disease threatens everyone, our communities, like the immigrants and refugees we serve, face, face acute difficulties because of pre-existing housing, food, and economic instability. Widespread job loss has, been, has had a disproportionate impact on our communities living in outer border neighborhoods and um, presents challenges for the health and safety and stability of thousands. Our communities battle barriers to access high quality health care and information. Furthermore, because of the anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric that has caused many to feel reluctant about enrolling in the services and benefits they need, um, our uh, communities are experiencing heightened stress, anxiety, fear, and isolation, and they are suffering in silence due to these stigmas and these fears. We do everything we can to balance safety with presence um, for these at-risk groups. Our programs continue to maintain contact with 2,300 families and more throughout this pandemic. In light of these observations, AFSC echoes CACF's message and mission by joining the 15% and growing campaign. We request the city to provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data on infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths in the APA community. Um, we must be able to track race and ethnicity and languages spoken for those who are tested so we can appropriately trace and take care of families. Since we are not doing this now, our APA communities and our struggles are being erased. We want to ensure that critical information gets to families in the language that they need. And it's only recent that Health and Hospitals was able to translate health outreach documents, and this was too late and is still not enough. And lastly, we want to address the mental health needs of children and families who have been targeted during this pandemic. There needs to be a system in place that can be prepared to help our communities as they return to daily life. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. As always, the Arab American Family Support Center stands ready to work with you in ensuring that all New Yorkers have access to the services and support that they need to lead healthy, safe, and fulfilling lives. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn it over to Yunha Grace Kim. Time starts now. My name is Inhei Grace Kim, and I'm an assistant director at Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. We truly appreciate Chair Levine and Rivera, a member of the Committee of Health and Hospital, for giving us the opportunity to share the impact and response to COVID-19 on our communities. 47 years ago, KCS became the first social services nonprofit organization serving the Korean community in New York. Since the pandemic, we have seen the need for more services such as home delivered meals, safety check-in calls for senior, healthcare consultation, and COVID-19 test site coordination. Due to increased demand of service, our staff has been working nonstop and helping monthly 7,000 people since March 2020 to target the health inequity COVID-19 has especially highlighted in our community. Our public health department has interacted with more than 3,000 people per month about a broad range of issues related to health and healthcare access. Especially our T2 team is going out to the field almost every day and reaching out average 1,000 people weekly. It was inevitable that everyone had to adapt to the new normal, one of which included virtual services due to the closing of many government agencies and offices. This limited the extent our services could provide and created more obstacle when assisting clients. For example, Ms. Kim could not go to social security office due to COVID-19 to make worse her husband had suddenly passed away, worsening her health condition and adding this layer of urgency to see a healthcare provider covered by Medicare. KCS assists her in enrolling in Medicare so that she can see healthcare provider and get proper medication. Therefore, in order for us to continue to help clients like Ms. Kim, we demand the city provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data in infection rate, hospitalization, and death in APA community. It is cri critical we be able to track people by race, the ethnic city, and language spoken for those who are tested so we can appropriately trace and serve the family most affected by COVID-19. Second, I'd like to urge the city health system to ensure that critical information get to families in languages that they need much faster rate than was when the city responded when COVID-19 first hit. One of our high, higher demanded services is interpretation service, specifically for healthcare related issues. We often advocate for our clients' rights and help resolve issues via conference call with third party agencies, such as health insurance companies, medical providers, and government agencies. 
Mrs. Sheen had a conflict with her primary care provider in regards to her health plan coverage. We contacted her PCP and found out that they needed the new Medicare number from a new card. As we, as with many community members with limited English proficiency. Time expired. All right, the client did not understand the situation and aware of a new card she was supposed to be given. So we helped Mrs. Sheen request a new Medicare card so that she can continue receiving the health service she needed. Lastly, I would like to emphasize the need for mental health service for APA children and families, especially those who of East Asian descent targeted during this pandemic. Um, mental health the service should be readily accessible for who do suffer from discriminatory, anti-Asian, racist, and xenophobic behavior linked to COVID-19. Due to rapidly changing circumstances, community-based organization role are more vital than ever to protect this vulnerable population. So city council must continue to increase its support for CBO by providing aforementioned services in communities disproportionately affected by pandemic. Thank you for this opportunity to share our thoughts and experience. We hope that New York City will continue this commitment by considering the suggestion contained. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now turn it over to Chair Rivera for questions. I just, I wanted to ask you, first, let me thank you. Um, I know that you've been doing this work for a very long time. You are the exact community-based organizations that we mentioned throughout this hearing who have been building, cultivating relationships and trust with, with people with uh, very, very sensitive backgrounds. You mentioned immigrants and refugees and so you heard maybe a little bit of the testimony earlier in the hearing as to some of the frustrations that council members have had in terms of trying to, I guess, be more proactive than reactionary. And I wonder what is your, considering your relationship with your community, how has the engagement process been? Not necessarily with your members, I realize the, the pivot during COVID, but with the administration as health and hospitals and the Department of Health really reached out to you knowing uh, your reputation? Um, how has that all worked out? Anyone can come? Sorry, I didn't pick on anyone specifically. Oh, KCS. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. So KCS, we are one of the um, the T2 partner organization, and even now, right now, they're in out there around the Kew Garden because it's a hot spot right now. So we closely communicate with health and hospital, and also we one time we requested to the health and hospital and mayor's office to have a COVID test in our site. So we coordinate a mobile event in September, I think two weeks um, early September, and we coordinated tested test um, like 350 people on our uh, our CBO uh, building with the mobile event, it was really successful. So we requested again to mayor's office to reach out, um, to provide us the, another opportunity, the mobile event test and then provide the community. And I think they, um, they were pretty responsive. Um, and also our T2 team is out there and the um, HNH hospital and the New York City department health department is pretty um, helpful for us to coordinate all of those events. Yeah, um, I can echo some of what um, Yoon Hee is saying. Uh, we've been working with um, health and hospitals and the mayor's office of immigrant affairs on uh, the NYC care initiative. Um, and through that, you know, we've gotten a lot of guidance and support. However, one of the things that we consistently, you know, need assistance with is on providing appropriate language materials, which often don't come to us in a timely manner. Um, and this is incredibly important because a lot of the materials that we do get received, it's probably translated or it is translated correctly in all ways and shapes. Um, I speak Bangla and I read and write fluently in Bangla. And a lot of the materials that we do receive in Bangla oftentimes are either too proper. So they're like academic Bangla, which not everyone in the community may be able to understand. And another issue is that when um, 
this is an issue with the font itself. When you copy and paste it often, the words get mixed up. So it's not an actual word that gets printed out. And that's something that we've also seen in something in like in the census literature throughout the city. Um, and this can be very confusing for our clients and our community members because the information there is not always um, understandable or understood. And that's where they come to us to help you know, have them understand what's happening. Um, you know, we've been given blank materials to provide our own information on, but sometimes we have to do the extra work and actually retranslate everything again, which can take away time from the work that we do in the communities. Um, so that's why the language access is really important. It's not just, are we having academic, um, are we having these tra translated in proper materials, but are we also having them translated in such a way that members of our community who are not as literate as those who are educated can also understand? Um, and then um, I think that's about it. Um, I hope that answered your question, Council Member Rivera. Absolutely, and I, I'm glad you brought up the census because I remember this happening multiple times and, and I, I want to thank you all for your work around the census as well. I know it's technically not over, but, but thank you. I want to turn it over to Chair Levine. You had a question? Actually, just a very brief comment. I, I want to thank the CBOs on this panel. This is exactly the kind of local leadership we need. Deeply involved in not just the delivery, but the design of the program. And I want to echo Ferris' point on translation. Unlike the work of translating for many other city agencies, what we've got right now is essentially a real-time emergency where new messaging is developed sometimes day to day. And we don't have the luxury of giving a translator weeks to produce good content. So we have to be able to turn out good translation within hours of the English, English language original. That's a big, big challenge. It's gonna require resources that we're probably not allocating yet, but we, we certainly join you in, in the call to up our translation game uh, because we know we have many months to go still in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other um, questions, we will now turn it to our last panel. Um, so in order of speaking, it will be Max Hadler and Haley and Haley Goenberg. So I will turn it over to Max and you can begin when ready. I'm starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Max Hadler. I'm the director of health policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. The NYC has been involved in a lot of aspects of test and trace. We're a contract and outreach partner. Uh, we're designing a training currently for contact tracers on immigrant New Yorkers health access and public charge concerns. And we're a member of the community advisory board. We applaud test and trace for establishing the cab and for contracting with CBOs, uh, including many of our members to support outreach and resource navigation. We also have remaining concerns as we continue to navigate the pandemic. DOHMH has led the CAB process and helped to allay some of the concerns and confusion that emerged from the mayor's decision to strip the contact tracing efforts from DOHMH's control, but there's still a lack of clarity on where different responsibilities lie, which is a major concern in the school reopening process. While the CAB's had meaningful input on several aspects of test and trace, testing and tracing in the context of school reopening has not been a significant source of discussion, and we're unaware of other community advisory processes informing the reopening process. Additionally, the seemingly haphazard creation of the situation room has added to the confusion and we're unclear on how to engage in the process. The rapid and inconsistent pace of change is particularly difficult to navigate for immigrant and limited English proficient families who would be better served by having a clear accountability and feedback mechanism that involves education advocates working specifically with immigrant families. On data privacy, we appreciate Test and Trace's work to improve its core message around data protection, but we still would like to see stronger public support from the city to urge the governor to sign into law the contact tracing confidentiality bill that Ali alluded to earlier. We're also still in the process of understanding the data security implications of the state's new COVID Alert NY app. Uh, we acknowledge that it's a voluntary add-on to existing efforts, but we're also concerned about the possibility that the app would deepen inequities if it in any way sidetracks or diverts messaging resources or time 
products that are not readily accessible to all New Yorkers, regardless of the language they speak or their access to smartphones or other app-enabled devices. The city's language access laws are also more expansive and frankly better than the state's, so the city should undertake a city-specific language access evaluation to be able to equitably use state-created apps or tools, in addition to considering how disparate tech access to app-enabled devices might deepen inequities. And overall, more broadly, we have to remember that the underlying conditions that have caused immigrant New Yorkers to be disproportionately affected by COVID-19 remain in place. Immigrants represent more than half of the city's essential workforce, signifying greater ongoing exposure. Undocumented and mixed status families have been excluded from federal relief programs, and many immigrant New Yorkers continue to suffer reduced access to health services during the pandemic because of the state's persistent health insurance discrimination against those without status. An equitable approach to test and trace has to account for these disadvantages by putting these communities first in planning for all subsequent stages of the pandemic, including the eventual distribution of vaccines. This includes making sure that any prioritizing of essential workers accounts for people who are often not part of the popular imagination of essential and who are disproportionately immigrant workers who may be in the informal sector. Thanks for the opportunity to testify, and we look forward to working with you on these issues. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now turn over to Haley Gorenberg. Time starts now. To quote Mary Bassett, public health has as its root the commitment to social justice. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, where I'm legal director, has an inviting interest and commitment by mission to our community partners and clients engaged in fighting marginalization based on race and health disparities fueled by systemic racism, all the more clearly a fight for people's lives in the age of COVID-19. Hiring thousands, of New Yorkers as contact tracers was obviously a key to reaching public health goals. And it also presented an opportunity to infuse jobs into communities most ravaged by paired crises of infection and unemployment. The brief hiring process, including the switcheroo from DOHMH to h h seemed chaotic and pell-mell to meet an opening metric, costing us the potential for higher effectiveness and equity. I emphasize the point because this was not the city's first rodeo and it won't be the last. There will be more opportunities to improve. New York City inexplicably elevated college degrees and professional public health experience when the World Health Organization and other authorities make perfectly clear that trusted community connection is the pivotal requirement for successful contact tracing and specifically flag that degrees are not needed. Some of the communities hardest hit have longstanding well-known barriers to college education. Prioritizing college degrees and professional experience in this instance undermines public health. And my written testimony includes details of our objections and our examination of every set of qualifications for contact tracers that we could find in job postings in 15 jurisdictions around the country, including New York State, starkly contrasting with what New York City required. The points were unaddressed throughout the brief and intense hiring period. The one official opined that the city ought not to be questioned because it had hired tracers for other public health reasons before, so knew what it was doing, but relying on old systems runs the risk of neglecting modern approaches to HR and it discounts entrenched bias that may pervade hiring systems. And finally, subsequently in stark contrast, officials helping run the T2 program later distanced themselves from the posting and said they didn't know how to come to exist. So we know public health efforts must address educated mistrust of the health establishment in black and brown communities based on historic abuses. And we know from Dr. Long that seven months into the pandemic, we're falling short of linguistic goals and of the stated public health goal of interviewing 75% of identified contexts. So anything that unjustifiably screens out people from communities most engaged in the fight against marginalization demands prioritized scrutiny and critique. Milpy urges the city take the following steps overhaul all hiring rubrics to ensure job qualifications match lockstep with job descriptions of what's to be done to avoid excluding people who can do a job well. Searching review is particularly important to ensure traditional frameworks don't carry forward systemic racism and other biases. Assess the city's assertion made as a purported sign of success that more than half of the I'm tracers- expired. Okay were hired from hardest hit communities. Why is hiring more than half the tracers from the communities considered successful? Why shouldn't a successful figure be closer to 100%? And I'll include more details about that. Um, conduct any additional T2 hiring using sound guidelines such as those from WHO as a guiding star. And thoroughly inquire about the h, &H optum split of jobs in the T2 program and make sure outreach for further hiring includes highly effective partnership with community organizations. 
And just one more point on that partnership with community organizations. Early in the pandemic, the city reached out to community organizations to form the Emergency Partner Engagement Council's working groups and the T2 Community Advisory Board and its working groups. Great idea, keep it up, make it more functional. Here's some ideas about how that can happen. Eliminate or coordinate overlap. EPIC and T2CAB both have messaging working groups. Despite inquiries, it's unclear to us how it makes sense to have two messaging groups, whether there's any functional demarcation in the work and whether the work of the two groups is being compared, contrasted, or synergized. Ensure the work product of community members and organizations in these groups is seen, assessed, and incorporated as is useful, and let us know clearly and in a timely fashion that it's being used, or ask us for something different. Too often it feels like we're pitching into the void. Address staff turnover and rotation. City staff facilitators for our working groups switch out every few weeks. We're constantly working to reestablish relationships. And the folks who facilitate seem dedicated and concerned, and then they're gone. It's a constant parade of apparently well-meaning people, especially when we're already having questions about where our suggestions, feedback, and work product go, the perpetual meet and greet further undermines our effectiveness. Thanks for all the good work to date. I include more detailed thanks in my written testimony and thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn it over to our final panelist, Anthony Feliciano. Time starts now. Can folks hear me? No, thank you. My apologies. My apologies. Late, um, you might have something open, like um, maybe the screen and something else. Okay. 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 Can we try again? It is because I have my phone because I can't have audio. Well, I would say I want to definitely hear you. So if the if you if it's something to do with the video and maybe you can only call in, I certainly want to hear your testimony with without the the screeching. Okay. Well, I don't know if he we lost uh, Mr. Feliciano, I'm sure he will return, maybe just with audio. Well, in, in, in the meantime, I want to make sure that, that I, I want to thank you for your recommendations uh, to, to the previous uh, panelists. And I certainly want to, I know, Chair Levine, you had a question? Well, j just very briefly, thank you. Um, uh, you brought up so many good points, Max. Can you clarify one thing that I think the public needs to know for sure? Does getting a city funded COVID test in any way trigger a public charge concern? No, thank you for the question. And I think uh, I appreciate every opportunity that we can all provide one another or take to, to clarify that. There is nothing about COVID testing or evaluation or treatment that would trigger any additional public charge risk. And also COVID testing and evaluation and treatment are free in New York City and even more broadly in, in New York State um, for people who qualify for emergency Medicaid, even if they're undocumented and don't qualify for other types of coverage, emergency Medicaid will cover those COVID specific services. So there's both uh, a coverage program as well as free services available and in no instance will those services um, increase someone's public charge risk. That is great news and, and important to amplify that to the public. Um, not really a question for Haley, but just a comment to, to thank you for raising the question of qualifications that are being required for the contact tracers. Um, it really does appear that there are that there are um, outstanding candidates for these roles from some of the marginalized communities we've been focusing on today who simply can't apply because they don't have the, re the required advanced degrees. I've actually specifically heard that in recent days about some of the Orthodox communities, which um, uh, as we've commented earlier, so need additional staffing, but I fear that's also true for marginalized communities more broadly in the city. So thank you for raising that and, and we join you um, in, in the pursuit of re-examining those qualifications so that we really do get the best people in those jobs 
um, and people who have deep roots in the communities that are affected. So thank you to, to Nyleg and thank you, Haley. And I, I think you wanted to, to, to say something to that point, um, Haley. I wanted to make sure we, we unmuted the panelists. And I wanted to just say the, the previous panel mentioned how even some of the documents were just a little bit too academic. And while I think someone with a, a master's degree can certainly make sure that language is accessible, I think it does help to have uh, people from all backgrounds. Uh, and, and, and before we get to your comment, Haley, I just wanted to also ask the panel um, have, I'm sure you've been in touch with the administration on the data privacy issues and, and, and the fears and sharing that, uh, you know, with agencies and fear of ICE, et cetera. We heard from NICLU about a bill that could potentially help that, but I'm not sure if you all have received any other information as to how you can reassure your members. And as you, as you formulate policy as to that, that data is in fact protected. I just want to make sure we get to you, Haley, and I don't know if Max, you have anything to add, but thanks to the, thanks to the panel. We have clearly raised the concern about this sort of carve out not to be revealed except as required by law enforcement is such a big hole to drive a truck through that people are not reassured that just that is not effective in getting the message out. Everybody knows it. Um, and I wanted to actually connect to what Max was saying and to the question about public charge. We do try to be very clear about this and about um, public charge and being safe from that. But one of the things that we've been raising recently in multiple meetings is that saying free testing is of concern when people walk in and it's not exactly free. It might not be out of your pocket, but you're asked to provide insurance if you have it. And then people feel like there's a bait and switch or they're being lied to and that actually there is something that's sort of going on their record that they have to pay or that could otherwise be used against them. And so this sort of free testing, this is not working. We need to be super clear and honest with people about what's really going on. And, um, and if not, it undermines that trust and willingness to engage. Yeah, I would just say on the, the data security piece, I think the single best thing that, that New York State can do, and, and really everyone in New York State has taken the actions they need to take, the only person who refuses to take action is the governor, is to sign that bill. Because there's, there's previous evidence in, um, in other infectious disease control and, and with public health surveillance data that shows that you need really strong protections that are specifically related to the data that's being collected for a given uh, issue or a given disease like COVID-19 in order to, to fully seal off that information um, from federal authorities. And I don't, I don't think anyone needs a, a reminder about what federal authorities that we're, we're talking about right now. And so I think, um, you know, wasting time signing a bill that was passed unanimously in both the, the Senate and the Assembly is really inexplicable. And while we are encouraging community members to participate in the process and, um, and working with the administration on the messaging around New York City code being fairly strong around protecting information and also the fact that they don't collect um, information about immigration status or social security number that in, to, to, to be sure about that and to close off the huge hole that Haley just mentioned, we really need to, to sign this bill into law. Thank you. Um, I think that we may have had Anthony Feliciano call in. So I wanted to see if we could, see if everyone could participate. Yes, I, I have joined by, by audio. Sorry about that earlier. Time starts uh, now. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry. My, uh, my audio was having problems earlier, um, so I'm on my phone. Um, I'm Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System, and I want to thank uh, uh, Councilman Carlina Rivera and Councilman Mark Levine and the rest of the council for holding this other hearing and feel strongly that probably be more of a series of hearings that need to happen particular issues. I heard a little bit of my colleagues uh, that were speaking and I'm in congruence with that, all of them and what they have recommended. I just want to touch on in a few other areas uh, that may have been connected or not because I joined late. We see a mayor administration with many task forces, uh, many work groups, and it seems to be no real plan how they all align and coordinate. Some duplications I'm seeing 
um, including communication, messaging, and so on. And I'm part of the T2 cab. And so there uh, concerns me that with this much so-called busy work, uh, that there is no real coordination and planning. So sometimes it's a plan to plan, which concerns me as a community advocate um, and as a public health professional. The other aspect of this is with the hospitals. They are so, supposed to submit their surge capacity and pandemic plans and want to know how transparent those plans will be, where the community engagement will occur, and they're really going to address uh, any new surges that will occur. And so those things are critically important. In the past, I've seen hospitals submit plans that are plan to plan again, but also a cut and paste of previous needs assessments and all that with no real um, concrete de uh, development in terms of um, contingencies and remediation. And so that's critically important. The other asset, I think, is as we're reopening the city uh, piece by piece, I think we're forgetting that certain communities face differential exposure and extensive corresponding implications. As if we said from the get-go, black and brown communities have been dying disproportionately. We all know why. But somehow, at every moment we have this part of our reopening, every moment we're thinking about planning with the hospitals, it seems to be still an afterthought. And that's what compounds the tragedy even further. And so those are critically important. I think the other area to think about, um, and there's a little bit more detail, but to figure out how hospitals are uh, taking care, particularly people with asthma and so on, because we have do this all this COVID remediation a result in exposure to more toxic cleaning chemicals. And so I'm thinking about how doctors and patients come together, particularly with children with asthma and so on, and how we're addressing that. So in part of any planning, we need to think of things that are we weren't even thinking of around before um, in order to Time address expired. these issues. The only thing I would add is during this flu season, the, the huge confusion that will happen between COVID and flu. And then if we're not getting the messaging right just on COVID, the way it should be in a more linguistic and company way, we're going to have problems further when people are confused between having the flu or COVID. So I, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we appreciate everybody's time and their testimonies. I just want to see if we've inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify. Please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Rivera because we have concluded public testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everyone who has testified. Um, want to make sure, Chair Levine, if there was anything you, you wanted to say before I close this out? No, thank, thank you, Chair, for excellent work in this hearing, as always, and grateful to all our colleagues and the public who participated. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I second that. Thanks, everyone, for bringing up um, so many concerns, language access, data privacy, working with our community-based organizations, um, and certainly making sure that we are doing this equitably, especially for our communities disproportionately impacted. And so we have completed public testimony for this hearing. I just want to um, also mention to the administration, just specifically, uh, there were some, some issues brought up for, for certain communities and neighborhoods. Uh, specific data requested. So we're looking forward to following up with you on some of those items and of course to all the public for testifying today. And with that, um, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much.